a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. This I believe. What does a successful broker believe? One who has written a bestseller called How to Lay a Nest Egg. A man who is a director of many companies and active in civic affairs. Here is Mr. Edgar Scott to tell us what he believes. I'd like to begin with the things I don't believe. I don't believe in the accidental theories of creation and evolution. I can't believe that a couple of atoms accidentally bumping into each other billions of years ago and a lot more unplanned accidents through the ages, led at last to the beauty of flowers, of music, of the people I love best. Bacon said, I had rather believe all the fables in the legends of the Talmud and the Alcoran than that this universal frame is without a mind. Besides being the mind of the universal frame, what else is God? Is he a divine providence? I should think so in a broad sense. But I can't possibly believe in a providence, one of whose jobs is to give me everything I think I want on earth. Another thing I can't believe is that God intended this world to be perfect. People baffle me who claim that the presence of evil on earth proves the absence of God. It seems to me that either we are here to prepare the world for some future destiny, or that the world is here to prepare us, like a great school. I suppose most of us prefer the second thought to the first because it implies that we are eternal. Maybe we are actually eternal as individual spirits. Or maybe the life in us is a little share of spirit which returns to a great all-inclusive spirit whence it came. How can we possibly know? But we needn't be troubled. If death is followed by the endless sleep of non-existence, it won't hurt. We won't be there. If we are immortal... I have faith that immortality must be a shining thing to be anticipated with a glad heart. Of course, the riddle of life and death is still there like an unsolved puzzle, fascinating and sometimes terrifying. Maybe, as a remarkable book written years ago by a Russian says, the universe is four-dimensional, four, five, or even six, in which case our own three-dimensional limitations would make it impossible for us to see God, eternity, and the rest of it, even though they were all around us all the time. Frankly, I don't understand that, but I'm inclined to believe it. I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus as a man who, as William DeWitt Hyde said, translated law into love and thereby won the spiritual leadership of the world. Love, I think, is the key to the good life. I believe that love and real consideration of one's fellow man, the insistence on giving him a just and fair break in all dealings, are the characteristics of the truly strong. Prejudice, distrust, meanness, the dirty trick, are born of insecurity and weakness. They are the hallmarks of the small soul. I feel there are things too big for man to dominate. The big things we must live by and live with, things to which we must surrender. Some people, hardened by the tough problems of making a living in a competitive world, refuse to surrender. What they can dominate, they shun. To me, they are the unfortunates. They miss the richest experiences of life, service of a great cause, the search for truth, inspiration, big joy, and a selfless love which transcends them all. I like the hymn that tells us, lay hold on life. I try to keep busy living life as fully as I can. I try to remember Stevenson's advice to turn our back on apprehensions and embrace that shining and courageous virtue, faith. Faith in God, in the boundless possibilities of man, in the good life here on earth, and, if that's the way it is, hereafter. There you have the belief of Edgar Scott, a financier who knows that there are things too big for man to dominate. Things to which we must surrender. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Hello, Ethelbert. What are you reading? Hiya, Casey. 
I'm just brushing up on the baseball scores. Is that so? I didn't know you were a baseball fan. Oh, sure. I follow the Dodgers every year. Hmm. Who's your favorite team, Casey? Well, I usually root for the Yankees. How about you, Tony? Who, me? Why, naturally, I root for Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Laughing Killer. <laughs> Midnight, and the Blue Note Cafe is doing its usual brisk midnight business. From the service end of the bar, a waiter beckons to Ethelbert, the head bartender. What do you want, Walter? Uh, the guy at that table by the wall wants another drink, Ethelbert. How about it? He's licked to the eyes. Uh, you better collect his bill and ease him into a cab. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Huh? His face is familiar. You know who he is, Walter? No. He's a new one to me. Hmm. Uh. I can't place him, but he's a clean-cut looking guy. Yeah. See, he gets a right cab, Walter, with a driver you know, huh? Okay. If I can get him out and into a cab. Hi, Ethelbert. Oh, Casey. Hello. Evening, Miss Williams. You Hi. two just put the paper to bed? Yeah. Nothing to do now but go home and get some shut eye. Oh, and how I'll go for that. Oh, I'm tired. You and me both, Annie. Uh, Ethelbert, give me a pack of cigarettes, will you? Same old brand? Sure, same old brand. What do you think? Here. Yeah. Pick up what you need. Why, you got a bullet mixed up with that silver. A bullet? Uh, oh. Oh, Captain Logan gave that to Casey today. Yeah? This thirty-two caliber shell was in an automatic that killed a guy last month, pal. Casey helped Logan get the killer, so that cartridge is to remember him by. A little slug just like that bumps someone off, huh? A thirty-two is big enough when it gets inside you. Oh, oh. Don't go into details. I can imagine. I don't want to go home. I look. I want another drink. Please, mister. Oh, no, I don't want to go. One of your customers isn't listening to reason, Ethelbert. Uh, Ethelbert, hey. Hmm? Isn't that drunk Artie Maddox? Artie Maddox? Yeah. Sure, I knew I'd seen him before. When did he get out of the big house, Casey? Last month on parole. I meant to look him up, but I haven't had time. You mean that nice-looking man is an ex-convict? Yeah, and he was sent up for murder, Miss Williams. Well, not quite. That was manslaughter. A lot of doubt that he was guilty even of that, too. Mm, that's so. What? His case was hot news before you come to this town, Miss Williams. Artie Maddox was an orchestra leader. Well, he had one of the best sweet bands in the country, Annie. Before he met some dame who calls herself Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Oh, the uh, the big uh, blue singer. Oh, that's right. And you can shorten the gypsy part of her name to plain Gyp. That'd describe her better. Well, what happened? Well, she was singing in a roadhouse and Artie heard her. He hired her and... Gave her a feature spot with his band. Then he went nuts about her and wanted to marry her. But she just kind of strung him along in order to meet more important guys. One of which was Phil Blaney. At that time, Annie, five years ago, Blaney was a big shot in the gambling racket here. You mean he had the spot that Lou Carboni has now? Uh Uh-huh. Carboni then was merely Blaney's first assistant. Well, Blaney went for the gypsy gal in a big way. One night, the cops got a phone call from Gypsy who said there'd been an accident in her apartment. When they got there, they found Blaney with a bullet in his head, and Artie Maddox was in the apartment. He said Blaney had pulled a gun on him, that there'd been a struggle. The gun went off in Blaney's direction. Of course, Gypsy told the same story. A lot of folks, including the cops, were more than half convinced that it was she who'd really shot Blaney in cold blood, and that Artie Maddox told the story he did to protect her. Yeah. But she came out of the mess undamaged, and poor Artie went to jail. And he hadn't been in the big house six months when Gypsy Hibbard married Lou Carboni, who'd fallen hair to Blaney's racket. Nice girl. Yeah. So nice that even a rat like Carboni couldn't stand for her long. They separated a little while afterwards, and Gypsy got a divorce and heavy alimony. Well, Artie Maddox is out on parole now. That's all. I don't want to go home. 
Except that he won't stay out if the parole board hears he's getting plastered. If those waiters are going to get him out of here, it looks as though they'll have to carry him out. Hey, maybe I could straighten him oh, out. Oh, now, Casey, don't start one of your Boy Scout acts. Huh? Walter will put him in a cab, Casey. Well, yeah, what happens after he's put out of the cab? I'm going over there. Go on, I don't want to go home. I now, look that. here, mister. Uh, I'll take care of him, Walter. What? You know this guy, Casey? Sure. Remember me, Artie? Uh, Sure. You're a cop, ain't you? No. I'm no cop. But you know, it wouldn't be good if a cop saw you right now. A guy on parole is supposed to behave himself. Well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just celebrating something. Something awful funny that's happened. <laughs> you never guess the funny thing that's happened. Well, suppose right? I run you home, huh? You tell me about it on the way. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell anybody. But... <laughs> You can read about it in the papers tomorrow. Okay, but let me take you home anyway. Now you can read it in the papers. Hey, say, you work on a paper. I remember you now. You're Casey. That's right. Hey, Casey, good old Casey. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, hey, no, hey, no, hey, no, 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 wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. We'll minute. have one later. We'll have one later. You got a bottle at home, Artie? Uh, sure, I got a bottle well, at that's home. That's fine. Suppose you take me there and we'll have a talk about old times. Huh? I'd, I'd like to talk tonight. I'd like to talk. Where are you living? For Buckingham Apartments. It's uh, 6th Street, number 614. 614. 614. All right, that's fine. Well, let's go. Come on. You're not just trying to get me out of here. Of course not. Come on, pal. Come on. Okay. (laughs) Well, the funniest thing happened tonight, Casey. The funniest thing. Get him into his apartment. What did he do? Give you the number before he Yeah, left? to the second floor. All right, here goes. Hey, you're uh, not going to carry him. It's the only way he can be moved. But this uh, is a walk-up place, Casey. This is the stairs. Oh, poor guy isn't here. Open the door for me, will you, Annie? Oh, all right, sure. Mm. Oh, I'd better come along and help you with the apartment door. Yeah, you? if you don't mind, honey. Gee, it's an awful cheap-looking place. Well, guys don't usually come out of prison heavy with dough. Well, I wonder who's... What's he living on? Dixie Trumbull, a songwriter, was always Artie's closest pal. Right. Imagine Dixie's putting him up for. He hasn't been on the chip lately either. Here we are. It's 2B. Uh, All right. You have to go through his pockets and find the key. Yeah, yeah. I'll prop him up right, right here. Right. Funniest thing happened. Right? Hey, he's snapping out of the case. Yeah. Funniest thing. Uh-oh. Passed out again. Yeah. I wonder where he carries his yeah. key. Uh, Annie. Huh? Look at this. Automatic pistol. This was in his pocket. Chump's just out of jail on parole. He's totally a gat. Uh oh. This doesn't look good, Casey. Looks lousy. Hey, Annie. Yeah. This gun was fired not long ago. Fired? Yeah, smell it. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let's look at the clip. Yeah. One cartridge missing. What do you think? Your guess is as good as mine. The funniest thing happened tonight. Funniest hey, thing. Hey, I found his key. Here, Annie, unlock the door, will you? No, okay. I'm going to snap this guy out of his daze and ask him a few questions. All right, switch on the light. Oh, yeah. Uh, here we are. How are you going to make him talk? Yeah, there. Yeah. You find some coffee in that kitchenette, will you, Annie, while I hold this guy up? Yeah. Make a pot of triple strength while you're doing it. I'll be ducking this guy in a cold bath. Okay. All right, now, Artie. Uh, Come into this bathroom. Hmm. Get those clothes off you. Uh, funny. Thing happened. <laughs> yeah, maybe it won't seem so funny after you hit this cold water. Yeah. Oh, look at how you. Hey, uh, go back, Casey. Don't push my head under. Can you freeze? All right, Artie. Okay, okay. I think you're on the sober side now. Come on, get out of the tub, put on your clothes. Come out. Yeah. Lady's making some hot coffee. Lady? Yeah, a friend of mine. Oh. I'll leave you alone now. Don't be long. I want to have a considerable talk with you. Talk? What about? Stay to your health. Get dressed and hurry. 
he okay, Casey? And he knows what's going on around him now, anyway. Did he tell you anything? I haven't mentioned the gun. Then let's have another look at that thing. Yeah. Foreign make. 29.5 caliber. It's got a pearl grip on it. It looks like a woman's gun. Yeah. Hey, it's funny. Phil Blaney was killed with a fancy little gat like this. You mean the man Maddox went to jail for yes. killing? Yes. The bullet they took out of his head was a 29.5. I remember because it's an unusual caliber for pistol ammunition. Oh? You see, in this country, we standardize pretty much on 22s, 25s, and 32s. Like the cartridge Logan handed me today, 38s and 45s. What? Someone's tying the outside door. Yeah. Who's there? Open up, we're police. Police? Open up, Maddox, and we're blast our way in. Hey, that's Sergeant Flanagan's voice. It's the last warning, Maddox. Hold Open everything, up. Flanagan, and I'll let you in. Casey, what are you doing here? Mind if I ask you the same question? We've come to arrest Maddox for murder, that's all. Murder? Who? Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Yeah. She was killed about two hours ago in her apartment. Now then, where's Maddox? Why do you think Maddox had anything to do with it? He was seen leaving the building she lives in. She was shot with the same kind of gat that killed Blaney five years ago. A 29-5 automatic. Hey, Casey, Let me do the talking, Annie. The only talk I want to hear right now is the answer to, where's Maddox? He's here, Flanagan. Where? In the bathroom. There. Uh-huh. All right, bring him out, Sam. I'll cover you with my gun. Right, Sarge. Hey, Casey, he killed that woman with a gun. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. Don't mention that gun. In the bathroom, Sarge. He's gone. What? Hey, that open window. He must have swung under the fire escape and got away. Casey, you're to blame for him getting away. I am. You stalled me here while he was going out that window. I wasn't stalling you. Well, we'll see what Captain Logan thinks about it. You know, you've got me in a jam, pal. Well, I'll make Logan see you weren't to blame. Where is he? At the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment. Trying to find out just what happened there. Well, let's go. I want to find out what happened at the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, too. Mother's Day has become a fine American tradition, and many Americans make it a point to show their appreciation of Mother's role as homemaker by sending her bright flowers and also practical gifts, useful items to lessen her work and increase her enjoyment. And that's why a complete set of Fire King oven glass is so appropriate. As an experienced homemaker, she'll tell you how much better food tastes when baked in Fire King oven glass and how tempting is the appetizing clean look as the piping hot food is brought to the table. And as for cutting down her housework, well, Fire King oven glass cuts dishwashing time by a full two-thirds for you bake, serve, and reheat food in the same casserole or baking dish. Fire King Oven Glass has a beautiful pale blue color which adds charm to any table. Every piece is guaranteed for two years against oven breakage. Now you'll find complete sets at your favorite chain, variety, hardware, or department store. The ideal gift for Mother's Day or any day. Fire King Oven Glass is a product of Anchor Hocking. The most famous name in glass. That's why we were in Artie Maddox's apartment, Logan. That's all we know about him. Well, uh, when you undressed him before you stuck him in a cold tub, Casey, he didn't run across a gun in his clothes. I, I wasn't looking for a gun. Casey. Now, suppose you give Ann and me the lowdown on this shooting, pal. Well, a guy called up headquarters. Uh, wouldn't give his name, but he told us to pick up Lou Carboni and ask him why he'd just killed his ex-wife. Ask Lou Carboni why he'd killed Gypsy Hibbert. Yeah. So two of my men went to Carboni's home. They found him playing poker with three guys who said he hadn't left the house all evening. Hmm. At the same time he was being checked, I came here to Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, got the super to let me in, and found her lying on the living room floor with a twenty-nine-five slug in her head. And somebody told you they'd seen Artie Maddox leaving the building. Yeah, the superintendent. And checking the time he saw Maddox leave with the medical examiner's finding... A woman must have been shot just a few minutes before. Do you any idea who made that call to headquarters, Captain? Oh, I think Maddox made it. He killed Gypsy Hibbert because she married another guy, Lou Carboni, after Maddox took the rap for her in that blingy shooting. 
Maddox hated Carboni, too, for getting the gal he wanted. So he tries to frame Carboni for the murder he's just committed himself. You know, Carboni wasn't on good terms with his ex-wife. He wasn't seen near this building tonight. Maddox was. A real murderer would take good care not to be. Oh, yeah. yeah? Sergeant Flanagan, Captain. Now, come in, Sergeant. Carboni wants to know if he can go now, sir. Carboni's here? Yeah, yeah, I was questioning him in the kitchen before you arrived. I'll talk to him, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, Captain wants you, Mr. Carboni. Captain, it's so late. I uh, wonder... Carboni, you can go home now. But don't leave there without letting me know where I can reach you. Very well. Hello, Carboni. Oh. Hello, Casey. <laughs> Sergeant Flanagan tells me you helped the murderer of my ex-wife make his escape tonight. I don't believe Flanagan told you that. That I didn't, Casey. All I said was... Now, don't take me seriously. I was only kidding. Doesn't seem like a good time for kidding. You're in a spot, Carboni. What do you mean by that? Can't you figure it? Why, you... Never mind. Go on home, Carboni. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Perhaps you'd better tell Casey about my alibi, Captain. He has told me. It's a very good one. Good night. Oh. Well, Annie and I will be running along too, Logan. It's our bad luck this case had to break too late for a morning paper. <laughs> that is tough, isn't it? And I expect to have Art Maddox under arrest long before your next edition, so the afternoon sheets will get first crack at that news, too. Where do you expect to find Maddox? Well, there's a general alarm out. We'll pick him up. Say... You used to know him pretty well. Maybe you have an idea where he died out. I didn't even know where he lived until after I ran into him at the Blue Note tonight. Come on, Annie. Casey. Let's go, kid. Good night, Logan. All right. Casey, you used suppressed evidence. And you didn't tell Logan about that gun you found. You were swell, kid. You didn't tell him either. There's the outside door. But we've got to tell him. Otherwise, we're accessory. We won't bother with the elevator, Annie. Let's walk down. We're not leaving until you give that gun to Logan. Well, yes, we are. Come on. No. Give him the gun later. After I have a talk with Maddox. Talk with... You know where he'd find it? I think so. Which makes another little item I've suppressed. Why? Well, let's call it a hunch, Annie. I have a feeling that if the cops find Artie before I do, if they have that gun that seems to clinch his guilt, he hasn't got a chance. And he didn't shoot Gypsy Hibbert any more than he killed Phil Blaney. You think Carboni did it? What I'm thinking of now is locating Maddox. Well, where are you going to look for him? Well, he needs a friend tonight. A dependable friend. His closest pal is that songwriter, Dixie Trumbull. All right, we're heading for Dixie's place. <laughs> Set eyes on Artie for two, three days, Casey. On the level, he ain't here. Oh, listen, Dixie. Miss Williams and I want to help the guy. He needs help. Don't give me a wrong steer. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. And I got no idea where Artie is. It's okay, Dixie. Hello, Artie. Why, you said not to let anyone know you were here. Casey's my friend. Yes. This should convince you of that, fella. Oh, the gun. I figured you'd found it on me. And Casey didn't tell the police about it. Well... Take the shelves out of it. Put it here on this table until you tell me what to do with it. What does the gap mean, Artie? And what's the stuff about cops? I haven't told you, Dixie, because the less you know, the less trouble you'll have. I'll go out and take a walk for half an hour. Please, Dixie. Okay, pal. Guess you've got a good reason for asking. I have. That's all I need to know. See you later. I can't have him mixed up in this case. He's too grand a guy. This apartment of his was the only place I knew of to go after I ducked out that bathroom window. I spent five years in prison. I can't go back there. I heard the cop say he was looking for me. I lost my head. But we are doing a Gypsy Hibbers tonight. You don't think I killed her? I'd have given the cops that gun if I had. I told them to look for you here. Come on, let's have a lowdown. Okay. You know, I was crazy about Gypsy before... Yes, yes, I know. Before, yeah. Well, after I came out of jail, she wouldn't see me or even talk to me over the phone. Last night, I made up my mind I'd see her. I had to. Then, <laughs> it was funny. It's a funny part we want to hear about. Well, I, I, I sneaked up to her apartment. A guy in stairs showed me how to pick locks, and I, I sat in the dark waiting for her to come home. 
finally the outside door was opened with a key. It was Lou Carboni. Carboni? Yes, he sat down in the next room and waited in the dark. Then the door opened again. It was Gypsy this time. <laughs> he told her why he'd come to kill her. Then I watched him do it. You watched Why did Carboni kill her? <laughs> it was funny, Casey. It was, it was so funny I couldn't raise a hand to stop him. Come on, hold on to yourself, buddy. What did he say well, to her? She had been blackmailing him, you know, threatening to tell the cops it was really Carboni who killed Blaney. Carboni killed Blaney. And I had I had taken the rap because Gypsy told told me she had killed Blaine. She was protecting Carboni's end of my expense. Then she married Carboni and they got to hate each other. And tonight he killed her while I was there to, to watch. <laughs> it wasn't a funny case. It wasn't, it wasn't funny. <laughs> Come on, Archie. What happened after Carboni shot her? Come on, Archie. Pull out of it. Pull out of it. Folks. Who wiped his fingerprints off the gun? He put it in her hand to look as though she'd committed suicide. But he didn't know. I was watching. Then he let himself out the back way. I realize now there was a crazy thing to do, but I, I picked up the gun. I put it in my pocket. I thought he'd spoil his suicide setup. Then I got out of the place. I phoned the cops to pick him up. Artie, no jury's going to believe the story you just told us. I know that. This Carboni's not going to be free and alive while I pay for another murder he's committed. What do you mean? I got another gun before I came to Dixie's. You see? I'm going to kill Lou Carboni. Marty, give me that gun. Keep back, Casey. I'm going to kill Carboni today before the cops can find me. Don't be a fool. You've just said no jury will believe my story. Give me that gun. Keep back. You, you won't shoot me. Not to kill you. But I'll let you have it. He will shoot, Casey. Look out. Okay, Annie. Now, you two get into this clothes closet. I'm sorry, but this is the way it's got to be. It's a foolish way, Artie. It's the only way. Uh, no! Let me go! Give me back that gun! Not a chance! I never figured you for a killer, Artie. You're not going to louse me up by shooting Carboni or anybody else. Frank! Casey! <laughs> Drop the gun you just took from him, Casey. <laughs> Drop it! Carboni? There's nothing else I can do, Carboni. Thanks. Now all of you move back against that wall. You see, Maddox? Why, Casey, I figured you'd hide out with Dixie Trumbull. Why did you come here? That gun I planted beside my late wife's body wasn't found there. And I leave nothing to chance. When your bodies are found, Casey, it'll be thought that Maddox killed you and this lady before committing suicide. Mm, same old gag. The gun to be found in Artie's hand... Same as you met that one on the table to be found in gypsies. It's always a good gag before a jury. And I'll use the gun on that table, the one that killed my former wife. Then there'll be no doubt that you did all the shooting, Maddox. Are you? You keep quiet, Artie. He'd better. <laughs> Sweet little gun, this five automatic. <laughs> always like these imported gas. Well... You take the first slug from it, Casey. But what's wrong? That twenty-nine five isn't loaded, Carboni. The shells are in my pocket. Give them to me. You can't hold your other gun and load the automatic, too. You can load it. With a barrel pointed at Miss Williams. We can make a single phony move. All right. I know when I'm licked. Take the gun. Put a shell in its chamber first. Okay. Now load the clip. This shoot you. Hold the gun by the barrel and slide the clip in. Now what? Put the gun on the table. Don't get your finger near the trigger. There. <laughs> nice little guns. Those 29 vibes. Get ready to take it, Casey. Okay. I got you and the lady into this case. You'll get the second slug, Maddox. Then Miss Williams. Now, uh, Casey... So long. With that shell, Carboni, so long to you. The gun blew up. Yes, it exploded right in his face. Right in his face. Wasn't it funny? Uh, wasn't it funny? We'll join the crowd at the Blue Note in just a moment. 
Last week, we told you about a sensational announcement from Anchor Hawking, which was to be made on the air tonight. However, we're obliged to postpone this exciting announcement until next Thursday, so be sure to tune in Crime Photographer one week from tonight. Now, meanwhile, surveys show that a vast majority of women prefer to buy foods packed in crystal clear glass. They give dozens of different reasons, but practically all say they prefer glass because it lets them see exactly what they buy before they buy it. Of the hundreds of young mothers questioned about baby food containers, eight out of nine say they not only prefer, but insist on prepared baby foods packed in glass. And their most important reasons are that glass is cleaner and more sanitary, and that leftovers can be resealed and safely stored in the original container. Now you too can enjoy these advantages in buying foods. Simply demand foods packed in glass in anchor glass containers sealed by tamper-proof Anchor Vacuum Caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Well, the explanation, of course, is very simple, Ethelbert. You see, I... I forced the 32 caliber cartridge Logan gave me yesterday into the chamber of that 29 5 caliber automatic. And it wouldn't pass through a barrel that was too small by two and a half hundredths of an inch. You remember, uh, remember, Ethelbert, that inventor's machine gun that blew up because the shells were too large? Yeah. yeah. The explosion didn't kill Carboni, huh? No. He'll live to go to the chair. And as for Artie Maddox, the criminal record he never deserved is being wiped off the book. So he'll just live again. Funny, wasn't it? Yeah. Funny. Very funny. Crime Photographer, starring Scott Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Deep. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. The part of Maddox was played by Lawson Zerby, and Herman Citizen is the Blue Note pianist. If you're under 35 and are a high school graduate, you may be able to qualify for a nursing career. As the need for nurses is urgent, check with your local hospital on how to apply for training. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town, so stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This, I believe. Edgar Turlington is a Washington, D.C. attorney and a recognized authority in international law. After graduating from the University of North Carolina, he went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and took first honors in jurisprudence. Upon his return to the United States, he taught Latin and English for a while at his alma mater, but soon went into the field of international relations as a special assistant to the Department of State. 
a long and distinguished career in the teaching and the practice of international law in various State Department positions followed. Since 1940, he has been in private practice. This is Edgar Turlington's creed. I belong to that large group of Americans who got a terrific jolt when we first heard about the evolution of man. That jolt loosened the foundations of the religious beliefs I had absorbed as I grew up. It took me a good many years to realize that there is no conflict between the scientists' conclusions as to the origin of man and the statement in the book of Genesis that man was created in the image of God. That amazing figure of speech, created in the image of God, means to me, in the light of the scientists' conclusions, that man, through the processes of evolution, has acquired a spiritual capacity which the other animals do not have. I am not troubled now, as I was for many years, by the question as to when the essential difference between man and the other animals became apparent. It is enough for me, as a member of the human race, to feel sure that my life can have transcendent significance. The religion that I now have is primarily a religion of humanity. I have a tremendous respect for man and a firm faith in his future. The way he has developed from small beginnings excites my admiration. It would have been so easy for him to stop developing when he reached the point of having all he needed for comfort. But there was something in him that made him keep on, something that turned his thoughts and his skill to the creation of beauty, to the inquiry and knowledge and belief of truth for its own sake, to the conception and application of principles of justice and mercy, something that is coming to be recognized as the spirit of God working through man for ends that we cannot know. Considering that man came up from the jungle, I am not too greatly shocked by his frequent failures to conform to the standards he has evolved for his conduct in society, nor even by his current preoccupation with instruments of warfare which may be used for the destruction of hundreds of millions of human lives. I am on the contrary greatly encouraged by the fact that for the first time in human history men are giving serious consideration to the idea expressed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights four years ago that recognition of the inherent dignity of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. If that idea can become firmly rooted in the conscience of mankind, if all men everywhere can be assured the freedom from want and freedom from fear that are indispensable to the maintenance of human dignity, we shall not be far from the kingdom of God. Those are the beliefs of Edgar Turlington, a distinguished specialist in international law and a devoted champion of the freedoms of people everywhere. Stay away from me, lady. Far away. I hate the sick of you. Gold. Of all the colossal gold. Georgie. Yes, ma'am. I want Bullsey. Get him for me. Look, boss, nobody gets close enough to Bullsey to even see his face. Why not? His dog. More wolf than dog. It'll tear a man's throat open like a hot knife in it. Well, Georgie, afraid of a dog? Everybody's scared of that mud boss, not just me, everybody. I want Bullsey. Nobody moves in on my territory and gets away with it. And if you won't take care of him for me, well, I'll have to devise a little plan to remove him myself. <laughs> interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay, based on the famous Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer series of short subjects. In a moment, you will hear The Gangster Was a Lady, starring Blanche Yerka. Crime 
Does Not Pay, starring Blanche Yurka as Martha Lady Fuller in The Gangster Was a Lady. <laughs> Crime has its roots in many places, in slums, in greed, in lack of education, in warped minds. Martha Fuller was a product of none of these conditions. Educated, equally well-bred, Martha, known as Lady Fuller for obvious reasons, loved power and the feeling of controlling the destinies of men weaker than herself. Add to this a streak of cruelty plus a polish and personality that belied everything she did... And you have a picture of this woman who took the wrong way of her own volition, fully conscious of what she was about. Lady chose her field of operations, and with her loyal, if none too bright, Lieutenant Georgie Linden, Lady Fuller moved in. What do you want to come to a joint like this for, boss? Be patient, Georgie. You'll see. Oh, waiter. Yes, madame. Is there anything we can do for you? Does it matter which booth we sit in? Oh, no, madame. No matter... Business is not busy this time of today. Very well. Sit down, Georgie. This will do as well as another. It's back far enough. You uh, wish to order, madame? I have a stinger, Georgie. A shot with a beer chaser. Uh, sir, one stinger, one rye beer chaser. And uh, the proprietor. Well, something is wrong? From the sign on the window, I believe his name is Mario Festa. See, si. get Mr. Festa. Well, don't stand there. Bring Mr. Fester. Uh, yes, madame. Right away. One stinger, one ride, Mr. Fester. <laughs> it's a character, any boss? Like most people who work for their money, weak, bumbling. As you would say, a character. Ah, the woods is full of the boss. I beg your pardon. You ask for me? <laughs> yes, ma'am, I am. Sit down. I want to talk business. You want to talk business? One stinger, one ride, with beer and a side. Yes, put them down and go away. Well, Julio... Yes, sir. Right away. Yes, sir, of course. All right. Well, now, here's to your increased business, Mr. Festa, after you've done business with me. Well, uh, perhaps, madame, you will explain this to me. Trouble with your place, Festa. You don't have any music. Oh, orchestra I cannot afford. Cabaret license is too expensive. Canned music is reasonable. Sure, we can let you have a jukebox and records cheap. All the latest. Bebop, everything. Make the joint jump. Oh, please. I run the family-type restaurant with small bar, uh, as you see. This kind of music, no, not for this place. We think you ought to have one. You tell me my business? Show him, Georgie. Check. Ever seen brass knuckles before, Mr. Fester? They, uh, they fit good. We think you ought to order a jukebox, Mr. Fester, from us. Please, uh, I don't make much money. Uh, I don't need the jukebox. Such music, such records, they... The gentleman they... seems reluctant, Georgie. Show him your brand of salesmanship. Check. <laughs> Get out. Get out. You... Lady Hoodlum. All right, Georgie. Pay him for the drinks. And for the insult. You bet, boss. It's a pleasure. Look. Look. Okay, Georgie. Use one of those paper napkins to clean the knuckles. Now then, you, Fester. We'll deliver a jukebox in the morning. The bill will be with it. Please. Yes. Yes. You leave me alone. Please. Pay your bills. That's all. Waiter. Take care of your boss. And have someone clean up that blood on the floor. Hey, boss. This character has a music maker. Oh, I see. And here. Stop a gaudy, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. I kind of like all those colored lights. Well, I'll give you a lesson in taste later. Here's the owner. Hey, madam, what can I do for you? You the Schwartz that owns this place? I am. Where did you get that horrible musical contraption? <laughs> the jukebox? I, um, rent it. You'll get a better deal with my firm. Yeah? How do you know? I haven't told you what this one cost me. Whatever it is, it will cost you less. You know, ma'am, I've rather been expecting you. That's so. Very interesting. You're uh, Lady Fuller, aren't you? And this is your boy, George. Should I give it to him now, boy? Quiet, Georgie. 
May I inquire, Mr. Schwartz, how you know my name? Of course. Mr. Bob Bolsey told me to expect you. Bolsey? So you see, Miss Fuller, as I'm contracted with a ballsy outfit, I can hardly deal with you. I'm sure you'll understand what would happen. Oh, I understand. However, I think you'll soon be dealing with me. Could you uh, protect me against Bolsey? That may not be necessary. Careful, boss. We don't know this guy. I think we know him very well. Now, he pays off to Bolsey, out of my territory. Very well. Before he's much older, he'll pay off to us. But double, because he made his deal with Bolsey before he talked with me. Good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. What now, boss? You'll see. Live long enough and you may learn, don't you? Yeah. Mr. Bolsey? This is Martha Fuller. Well, the lady. To what or uh, whom am I indebted for this time? You can cut the jokes until we meet in person, Bolsey. Yeah, you do really think we have a will? Not if you don't get out of my territory and stay out. But I'd be happy to attend you. <laughs> you deal from the top of the deck, don't you, lady? Straight from the top. Yeah, well, so do I. Tell me, uh, you have met Butch? Butch? Who's he? <laughs> Just a minute. Hey, Butch. Come here, come here, come here. Say hello to the lady. What is this, Bolsey? Another joke? <laughs> All right, down, Butch, down. No, lady, that's my bodyguard. Quite intelligent, too. Knows my enemies before I do at times. Look here, I have no time for nonsense. You get out of my territory or there'll be real trouble. Stay away from me, lady. Far away. I'd hate to sick my dog on you. The gall of all the colossal gall. Georgie. Yes, ma'am. I want Bolsey. Get him for me. Look, boss, nobody gets close enough to Bolsey to even see his face. Why not? His dog. It's more wolf than dog. Tear a man's throat open like a hot knife and butter. What's the matter, Georgie? Afraid of a dog? Everybody's scared of that mutt, boss. Not just me, everybody. I want Bolsey. Nobody moves in on my territory and gets away with it. If you won't take care of him for me, well, I'll just have to devise a little plan to remove him myself. You've got guts, boss. And brains. Tell me, Georgie, does Bolsey go in for women? Well, he ain't married, if that's what you mean. That's part of it. You know, Georgie, I have an idea that a couple of ladies are going to call on Bob Bolsey and Butch. A couple of dames? That's what I said. Now I'll pay strict attention, Georgie. This is what I have in mind. Yeah, Freddy. Hey, you got visitors. Yeah? We expecting anybody? Not a couple of dames, anyhow. Dames? Here? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Quiet, Butch. You know, that, that mud makes me nervous. Yeah, he won't bother you, unless I tell him to. Hey, what about the dames? Well, they got nerve, if nothing else. Yeah? No looks? Ah, eh, they'll do. Anyways, they, they sashay through the outside door, and the blonde says, We've come to see Mr. Robert Bolsey. Is he in? <laughs> Just like that, huh? <laughs> this I gotta see. And now you do see, Mr. Bolton. You don't mind, I hope? Your man took so long. Yeah, yeah, he did, didn't he? You want us to toss him out, boys? Well, I wouldn't think. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right. Quiet, Butch. What a wonderful dog. Is Butch his name? Yeah. All right, boy. Yeah, that's his name. He uh, doesn't seem to like my sister and me. No, he's uh, wary of strangers. Are you that way, too? Yeah, usually. Uh, what's your name? Mary. Mary Fairbanks. Yeah. Your sister? Louise. But she's a little shy with strangers. That's why she hasn't said anything. Yeah, I don't like this, boss. Let me tell him out. Before we find out what their business is? Of course not. What? Is your business with me, ladies? Our business? This. 
Go ahead, Georgie. Check, boss. Hey, boss, she's got a gun. Get him when ain't no danger. Hey, Butch, Butch, go get him. Wait. You shot Butch. I told you to stay out of my territory, Bolte. Let him have it, Georgie. No, don't you. You see, Georgie? The dog was no trouble at all. I almost didn't get the heater out, boss. Women's clothes. I must say you don't wear them with any style, Georgie. But no matter, our business is taken care of. We leave it the Morgan Tale. We have business elsewhere. <laughs> In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with The Gangster Was a Lady. We continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Blanche Yurka as Martha Lady Fuller in The Gangster Was a Lady. In due course, following the killing of Bob Bolsey and his man, the bodies were found, the police were called, and the routine of investigation was begun. Witnesses were their usual forgetful selves, as they usually are in such cases. Other members of Bolsey's gang found employment of sorts elsewhere, and the police under Lieutenant Dave Burns apparently drew a complete blank. But Lieutenant Burns was well aware of the rivalry between the Bolsey gang and the ladies' outfit. It was his business to know such things. Therefore, he sent his sergeant, Johnny Platt, on an errand. The sergeant returned, his errand completed. Hey, Lieutenant. Okay. Bring him in. All right, you two in here. Not exactly a luxurious layout, is it, Georgie? Oh, I seen some precincts that was dirtier. We'll do without that. Got your book and pencil, Sergeant? Yes, sir. You don't mind, Miss Fuller, if we take down your statement? Well, if you get a statement from either of us. Yeah. We ain't talking. We'll see about that. Do you mind if I sit down? As a matter of fact, I do mind, Fuller. Well, you're hardly a gentleman. Save it, Fuller. Who going to sit in my office? You picked yourself a man's racket, expect to be treated like a man. I see. Kind of third degree. Hmm? I want the answers to a few questions, and I intend to get them. Apparently, you don't care particularly what methods you use to obtain those answers. No, apparently I don't. Did you kill Bolsey and his boy? <laughs> You really don't expect me to answer that, do you, Lieutenant? Where were you the afternoon he was killed? Mm, let me see. Oh, yes, yes. George and I went for a drive in the country. Nature at this time of year is lovely, don't you think? Save it. Anybody uh, see you in the country? Did anyone, Georgie? No, not a living soul. Afraid we have no other alibi, Lieutenant. Bolsey invaded your territory, didn't he? Well, everybody knows that. I believe it was reported in the daily newspapers. Mm -hmm. That means war in your kind of world, doesn't it? But you seem to know all the answers, Lieutenant. Why ask me? I'm consulting you for an expert opinion. My consultant's fee is high, Lieutenant. Then you admit you are an expert. I admit nothing. And your sergeant can write that down, too. Now then, Lieutenant, I'm tired of standing... Are you holding us on charges or just making talk? Well, I could hold you on suspicion. I may do just that. And I want my lawyer before either George or I say another word. And, by the way, I wouldn't advise you to try to use that trespass in court. I'll claim duress. I doubt if a jury would like that. After all, I am a woman, Lieutenant. All finished for her? For the moment, yes. Good. Now, get this. I think you and your boy here killed Bolsey. I'm not too sure you didn't do this town a favor if you did kill him. But the law is the law. Someone will fry for those killings. The next time you come back here, you'll come back to stay. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you so much for the warning. I'm sure it's offered in a cooperative spirit. Come along, Georgie. I believe our visit here is at an end. Or did you have any further questions, Lieutenant? 
Get out, lady. Get out quick before I forget I'm an officer of the law and a gentleman. Here he is, Lieutenant. See? Wounds all healed. Yeah. <laughs> Great job, Doc. When we found him, he looked like one dead dog. Just creased, I think you call it. The bullet cut through the flesh on his skull and scored the top of his head. A fraction of an inch lower, he would have been dead. Mm-hmm. All right. Seems like a gentle enough hound for a German shepherd. Why? Do you have a reputation for viciousness? Well, from all we heard at headquarters, the whole underworld was scared of him. I believe he did kill a man once. Bolsey used him as a bodyguard. Hmm. Dog's been through a bad time. Suffered from shock. Here, Butch. Hi, fella. Yeah, <laughs> boy. Next thing you'll have him sit up and bay. Oh, he'd learn that sort of thing quite easily. He's an intelligent animal. Say, hey, could... Could Bolsey merely build up a legend about what? Easy, boy. Easy. Well, uh, not necessarily. Dogs can go through personality changes as a result of shock, just as humans do sometimes. Hmm. What do you know? Let them learn. Huh? In any case, he's safe for children now. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Up, Butch. Up. <coughs> um, what do you want me to do with him? <laughs> he's the only witness for the state. He deserves protection. Well, you're running up a big bill, Lieutenant. Butch has an expensive diet. Uh, I, I think I'll take him with me, Doc. What do you do with him? Oh, keep him around. I got a hunch about him. Yeah? yeah I have the idea that... Well, dogs are pretty loyal. Not much judgment, but loyal. Mm-hmm. Butch didn't know what his master really was, and he didn't care. But he just might be as interested, almost anyway, as I am, in finding the party who killed his master. Hmm. Looks like homicide has itself a pet to take care of. <laughs> Looks like Festa's doing business, doesn't it, Georgie? Sure does. You, Festa, come here. Sure. What do you want? More money, I don't have it. The joint's full, it's jumping. I can't pay you more. That's what you think. Ten dollars a week more, starting now. I won't do it. Georgie, call Julio over here. What are you going to do? Hey, Julio, come here. You don't make more trouble. You call me boss? All right, Georgie, lesson two for Mr. Festa. Let him have it. Uh, what you do with that a gun? No, no. You need a new waiter, Fester. This one's got a hole in him. You pay, Fester, or we'll ventilate you the same way. There's the total for the week, Georgie. Two and a half grand. Not bad. Not bad at all. I'll never understand it, boss. All that dough from the nickels and music boxes. It's arithmetic, Georgie. Enough of anything always adds up to a lot. Two and a half days a week. Yippee. Yeah, it'll get better as we expand our business. Answer the door, will you, Georgie? Yeah, sure, boys. Well, the 50 machines in the East Hill District. About a dozen on the south side. Hmm. And in the suburbs. I'll leave hey, we got in. company, boys. A pencil-pushing cop. Oh, Sergeant Platt. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. I uh, hope it's a pleasure, Miss Fuller. That <laughs> sounds ominous. Yeah, the lieutenant wants to see her. Said he'd have come himself, but he's kind of busy. He told me to apologize. And wasn't the lieutenant being a trifle sarcastic, Sergeant? So sergeants don't ask questions, lady, not from lieutenants. I got a squad car outside. Are you coming? No need to be so forceful, Sergeant. We'll be happy to visit the lieutenant, won't we, Georgie? Shall we go, gentlemen? This way, Miss Fuller. You remember? Yes, indeed I do. Don't look so worried, Georgie. I'm sure all the lieutenant wants are the answers to a few more questions. This is the door, isn't it, Sergeant? Yeah. That's it. Well, <laughs> Lieutenant Burns, how are you? Fair enough, Fuller. I see you brought your boy. Of course. You asked for him, didn't you? 
Quiet, boy. Quiet. What a nice big dog. Ever seen him before? Of course, Archie. Yes, sir. Can't say I have. Hey, he looks like A that. lot of other police dogs. Intelligent animals, for the most part. Is our police department setting up a canine division? Oh, no. No, nothing like that. I found this fellow in bad shape. Had a vet fix him up. He's mine now. I see. Nice of you, Lieutenant. Shall we get to business, Fuller? Of course. I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. The Bolsey case. You haven't a shred of evidence. We might get some. In 48 hours? Maybe less. We have our ways. You dare lay a finger on me. No, no, never on you. Not that some of our matrons wouldn't like the job. But we like to try the weaker sister first. I uh, wonder how uh, Georgie here would enjoy a small session in our cellar. Nobody can make me talk if I don't want to. You'll want to. My lawyer will have us out of here before you can... I don't have to let you talk to a lawyer for 24 hours. You try anything like this, Lieutenant, and I'll sue the city. I'll have your job. But I am trying. You'll it. get no place. You'll have no corroborating witnesses. Oh, won't I? You'll have nothing to take into court. Sergeant, hold the man. Yes, sir. Take your hands off me, copper. Go get her, Butch. Butch? Who's this dog? Yes. And he knows you, doesn't he? Oh, that's a good leash. Chain. He's got his temper back, Sergeant. Sick of Butch. Get her, boy. Get away from me. <laughs> Scared now, Fuller, when you haven't got your gun to shoot him with. Go get her, Butch. He tears your hem neatly, doesn't he? Wonder what he'll do to your leg or your throat. Stop it, stop it, he'll kill him. Go on, Butch. Back her into the corner. Go on, Butch. Go on. Back, back. back down. You call me for life. You kill me. Hold on. He's a wolf. That's no dog, it's a wolf. Get away from me. Get away. Uh, how'd you do it, Fuller? We heard about two dames. Get away. Get away, I say. How'd you get close enough to Bolsey? How, Fuller? Georgie. Georgie and my clothes. Our guns. Get that beast away. Get him away. Uh, who else did you kill? Talk, Fuller. Talk. No one. No one. Georgie killed the waiter. You told me to. You ordered it. You planned the whole thing. Get that away. Get that dog away. Get that dog away. Get that dog away. All right, down, Butch. Butch, stop it. Stop it. Uh, there we are. All right, Sergeant. We book them both for murder. <laughs> Strange of how a dog can change its personality. Crime does not pay. Lance Yurka, who was starred as Martha Lady Fuller in The Gangster Was a Lady, will be back with you in just a moment. In person is Blanche Yerka. It seems to me that if there is a moral to this story, it lies in the word fear. The two proprietors who were among the lady's victims let fear rule them. And it was too late. Everyone learned the high price of fear. A little courage at the beginning, when the victims had a chance to call in the proper authorities, might have obviated most of the damage done by the lady. Proper action at the proper time in real life will obviate a great deal of the damage done today by organized crime. But fear makes the price very high. The price is always too high for all concerned when you have to learn the hard way that crime does not pay. Thank you, Miss Yerka. <laughs> Crime Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Marx B. Loeb, with music composed and conducted by John Gart. Technical advisor is Burton B. Turkus. The Ifits characters and names used in the story you've just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental.
This I believe. Adina Campbell Dover is director of the Hickok Secretarial School in Boston, the oldest school of its kind in the United States. Several years ago, struck by the words of Jesus, I was in prison and ye visited me not. She decided to start a regular correspondence program with imprisoned men who had lost contact with the outside world. By now, through her efforts and with the cooperation of prison officials, many inmates are receiving regular letters, books, and cigarettes. This is Adina Campbell Dover's creed. Some years ago, I met a man who was the head of a large concern, and he incorporated into his work an unusual practice. At fairly regular intervals, he would collect a sizable number of his selling staff, and he himself would conduct short inspirational meetings based, oddly enough, on the teachings of Jesus. This man had another oddity. He tried to help just about everybody with whom he spoke. I spent only a brief half hour with him, yet I feel that my life was greatly influenced by that meeting. He literally went about doing good. Yet entirely by his own efforts, he became immensely wealthy, which indicated to me that helping others, especially those less fortunate, as well as introducing religion into business, is not only righteous, it is smart. I therefore believe the emphasis in business should be not on selling willy-nilly, but on protecting the public by better service and better goods, whether one sells insurance, automobiles, or, as I do, education. Before the FEPC was law, the question arose of admitting Negroes to my school. This involved the risk of antagonizing other students, some of whom were Southerners. As usual, we submitted the problem to the acid test, what would Jesus have us do? The conviction arrived at was so clear that we felt it would be presumptuous even to question the outcome. From that day on, anyone who could pass the educational standards, regardless of color, was welcome. A small percentage of Negroes have come through the years, but never by word or sign has any objection been made by any member of our student body. I believe that not only on Sunday, but on every day in the week, I should worship God and invoke his help in all my problems, and I do not believe that I should wait until catastrophe strikes, for I feel that at such times I pray not necessarily because I have faith, but because I am scared. A great rabbi once said, there are two ways to accomplish any worthwhile objective, the natural and the miraculous. The natural way is with God's help. The miraculous way is to do it alone. This is something apart from the all-inclusive daily prayer. It is the unemotional pinpointing of God's love and power to specific needs. Indeed, I believe that there is an urge within each of us for the satisfying ethical and spiritual values that are bound up in such a program of life. And I believe that if I were to work merely for material profit, I would be badly shortchanged. As John Marquand's hero in the play, Point of No Return, so wistfully puts it, I wish there were something more at the end than an annuity and a station wagon. This challenge, what would Jesus have me do? is neither pharisaical nor apologetic. It is not maudlin or churchy, and I do not hear voices or see visions. It is a workable, uncomplicated formula for increasing profits, ethically, spiritually, and in dollars and cents. This I believe. That was Adina Campbell Dover, who was director of the Hickok Secretarial School in Boston and the author of several business school textbooks. Calling all detectives. Private detectives get all sorts of clients. But I once had a murder case in which my client was me. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. Many people think that a private detective like me, Jerry Browning, has a lot of special rights and privileges. Far from it. I was sitting at a small table in the Montmartre, which is one of those intimate nightclubs. With luck, I hoped to see Johnny Laughlin walk into the place sometime during the evening. I wanted Johnny for having worked the flim-flam, one of the basic confidence games, on a man now my client. 
The man who pushed his way across the floor to my table was tall, dark, heavy-shouldered. Listen, Jake. You better my girl again and I'll slap your nose through the back of your head. I blinked. You're talking to the wrong man, pal. I never saw you or your girl before. All that did was infuriate the guy. Who are you trying to ritz? Stand up and fight or I'll knock that smike right off your puss. Under the circumstances, there was only one thing to do, and I did it. I yanked my blackjack from my pocket, kicked my chair out from under me, slapped the guy with the blackjack. And instantly, the three other men surrounded me. I had a gun. I struck out at him. Heard the bullet go past my ear, and from then on, was too busy to notice anything. After what seemed like hours, the lights went on. I found myself in the grip of two husky cops. There was a still figure on the floor. Mister, you're under arrest for murder. I got into a fight at a nightclub and found myself charged with murder. The next morning, I had a talk with my lawyer, and Lieutenant Dawson came over to see me from headquarters. They were both optimistic. Jerry, we've got it pretty well established that the guy did pick the fight with you. The only question now is who killed him? My lawyer shrugged. That's not our question, Lieutenant. Jerry's innocent, and I want him released. Dawson nodded absently. Yeah, sure. That's just formality. He turned to me. Jerry, I want you to come down to the morgue, take a look at the body. We haven't been able to identify it yet. I stared at the still body lying on the morgue slab, and I dreaded what I had to say. Dawson, this is not the fellow who picked the fight with me. You mean this poor guy was just an innocent bystander? My lawyer got red in the face. That doesn't alter the circumstances. Jerry had nothing to do with it. A hoodlum picked a fight and... I shrugged. Save it for court. We're liable to need it. A license as a private detective is not a license to engage in brawls. Even though Mr. Browning did not actually shoot the victim, he is responsible for the conditions culminating in the murder. I hold him for the grand jury. However, I will accept a petition for bail. In the four days previous to my scheduled appearance before the grand jury, I moved heaven and earth to find out the identity of the murdered man. All I learned was that he'd come into the nightclub alone just a few minutes before the fight started, had been sitting at a table right behind mine. For a while, I thought that the murder had some connection with Johnny Laughlin, the confidence man I'd been trying to capture. But even that slim hope disappeared when I entered the grand jury room. The district attorney shook a bony finger in my face. Members of the grand jury, this man Browning has been a troublemaker for years. He claims to have been seeking the capture of Johnny Laughlin, who was in the custody of New Orleans police 24 hours before the nightclub murder, as Browning should have known if he were more interested in his business than in brawls. What do you say to that, Browning? I had one chance, and I took it. Members of the grand jury, this was no murder growing out of a casual brawl. I've uncovered evidence that makes me believe the whole thing was carefully staged. A fight picked in order to make a deliberate murder look accidental. I'm sure the man who started it did not know I was a detective. He, he picked on whoever was nearest, the real intended victim. But something happened in the course of the fight which makes me sure I can solve the murder if the grand jury will give a week to do it in. The grand jury believed me. And I walked out of there with at least a technical chance to clear myself. That stuff about a deliberately staged fight was something I'd thought up in a moment of desperation. But the more I thought about it, the better I liked it. And in a conference with Dawson that same day, Dawson, the victim came there to meet somebody. He had no papers on him because he didn't dare have any and no money because he needed money badly. All that adds up to a lamister of some kind. Find out who's broken out of a jail lately or double-crossed a gang someplace and we'll at least have the victim identified. We had the identification two days later. Jerry, our man is Sandy Purcell. He used to be an accountant. Ran the books for an eastern gambling syndicate, sold inside information to another gang, and disappeared right after that. It's clear as you, Jerry. Yeah, but that's not enough. There's a certain guy I still have to catch up with. Now that I knew the kind of man I was after, my problem became simpler. What I was looking for was a big man with a big pain in his head. 
Gangland has its own doctors, men who for many reasons are not permitted to practice medicine, but who, for a price, will extract a bullet or patch a cracked skull. That's why five days later I was waiting outside a grimy tenement building on the west side. It cost me $200 to learn this address, but I figured it was well worth it. It was about an hour later when the man walked down the tenement steps. His hat was pulled way down, but not far enough to conceal either his face or the white line of bandages under the hat. He was the man who'd started the nightclub fight. I held my blackjack in my hand as I stopped him. Hello, pal. How's your girlfriend these days? I thought he'd faint. <laughs> Don't hit me. I'm a sick man. You, you almost killed me the last time. I'll finish it this time. I twirled the blackjack, let him hear its legal whistle. What do you say? We can talk at police headquarters. Or we can go to work right here. I'll talk any place. His name was Pete Terrell, and he worked as a dance hall bouncer, made extra money by beating people up on the side. He wasn't in on the actual murder, but he named the three men from Boston who'd hired him to start the nightclub fight that led to Sandy Purcell's murder. It was an old story. A guy who sells out a gang to another gang, then gets pushed off as useless. Sandy'd been threatening to talk unless he was taken care of. So they took care of him. Though not as he expected. Terrell was lucky. He only got five years. Of the rest, one got the chair, two others life sentences. Like I said, it makes no difference who you are. When you step into a courtroom, all you get is justice. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz, and a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. But on the top floor, we finally caught up with her. Crane, please, please. That ape, get him out of here. I'll do anything, anything. You treated me like an animal, Cecily. And now an animal shall treat you as you deserve. Choke you to death. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest and our fears the strongest. Our strength. At its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a moment in The Eighth Song. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Peter Martin is The Ape Song. and fog shroud a nondescript freighter just in from Africa and now unloading its cargo in New York Harbor. Down in the ship's deepest hold stands Crane Folliot, the famous big game hunter. Before him is an iron cage containing his latest conquest, a restless thing of panic and hysteria and insensate passions, a huge ape. <laughs> Quiet. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you, hurt you. I've killed too much already. And besides, I need you to live, need your help. Now, that's better. Yes, my friend, you shall live to save me from death. A death in life. I'll be taking them off in a minute. Huh? Oh, good. Lucky thing we were able to get a hold of another truck. Why the university forgot to send their truck is beyond me. Still, I don't think keeping the animal in my cellar overnight will harm him or anybody. Nah. Look at him shake, though. He's scared. Well, not scared, exactly. That's because, like all apes taken from their natural habitat, he imagines he's in the presence of death. 
dead. Yes. What's he doing now? Opening and closing his mouth as if he were trying to sing or something. How did you know? No. Know what? Oh, I'm sorry. No, you, you wouldn't know. They can sing, though. Yeah? They do. But only when they're in the presence of death. We rode home through the foggy night in the truck, the ape and I. The house was dark when we got there, and I had to give the driver and his helper an extra $20 to take the canvas-covered crate holding the ape around to the back door and into the cellar. Walking up the cellar stairs, I entered the front hall and... Uh... What is it? Is that you? Dr. Murchison. Yes, welcome home. Uh, what? what are you doing here? Your wife was just going out when I came here, but she let me in and I've been waiting for you. Waiting for me? Yes. I was about to go myself when I heard the noise downstairs. Oh, I suppose you want to know where the ape is. Well, he's downstairs in the cellar. I see. Fulliard, why did you bring the ape here rather than to my laboratory? Well, the laboratory truck never arrived. What? That's impossible. I personally arranged for it to meet you at the pier. Why are you questioning me, Dr. Murchison? You don't really think I want an ape as a house guest, do you? The only thing I was interested in was to get the ape to a safe place until morning. Then I was going to call you. I see. Uh, can't you wait to start cutting him up, whatever you intend to do with him? Do you want to take him with you now? Well, you know that's impossible, Fulliard. And you know we don't intend to cut him up. Well, I... I'm sorry, Doctor, but the strain taking care of him, you know what delicate animals they are. Uh, won't you come into my study and we can talk? Thanks, Fulliard, but now that I know he's safe, I must be running along. As you wish. When, uh, when will you send the truck around and take him to the laboratory? Oh, around noon, I should say. Good. Get some sleep, man. You look terribly tired. Yes, good, peaceful sleep at last. Hello, someone's at the door. Uh, yes, yes, I imagine it's my wife. Oh, oh, Crane. Hello, Cecily. You're back. Yes. Why? Why? That's a strange question. You know Dr. Murchison, don't you? Yes. I was just about to leave, Mrs. Follier. You must excuse my wife, Doctor. She's so pleased at seeing me that she's forgotten her manners. I understand. Well, I'll be in touch with you. Brian? Good night, Mrs. Follier. Good night. Crane, you promised you'd stay away until November. Yes, I know I did. But the thought of you all alone in this big house doing nothing but waiting for me to return to your welcoming arms. What else could I do but rush home as quickly as I could, my dear? Don't be sarcastic, Crane. On the contrary, my dear. I'm not being half as sarcastic as I'd like to be. Excuse me, I, I'm going to bed. But uh, don't you care for me just a little, Cecily? Just enough to kiss me goodnight. Let me pass. I've never asked very much of you, you know. No more than the friendly pat on the head you give to your dog. I said, let me pass. Yes, Cecily. But first, there's something I must tell you. How tired I am of being a hunter, of killing wild animals instead of enjoying the happiness of my home with you. You seem to enjoy your hunting trips well enough. You're always going on them and bragging about them to everybody. Now, let me pass, Crane. Please believe me, Cecily. Hunting is only a substitute... A very unsatisfactory substitute for the love I hope to receive from you. I never do. I thought we'd settled all that. Yes, but I... I never dreamed you'd treat me like some loathsome animal you couldn't bear near you as though I wasn't a man but an ape. When are you leaving on your next trip? When? Yes. Because until you do, I'm going away. If you hate me so much, my dear, why don't you go to Reno and get divorced? You know my family doesn't approve of divorce. Of course they don't. Especially when it's a matter of losing the foliate millions along with the husband. How can you be so disgusting? Something terrible has happened to me, Cecily. Something which forbids me ever to go hunting again. Don't make silly excuses. You know you love to hunt. Not to... anymore, Cecily. Something has happened that makes me terrified ever to hunt again. What on earth are you talking about? I really can't explain it, my dear. But on this last trip... Every time I killed a wild animal, I imagined I was killing... I was killing you. 
I watched her run up the stairs in terror. I heard the slam of her bedroom door. Stood there at the foot of the stairs for a moment, dazed. Yet more certain than ever of what I had to do. And then quite unexpectedly, I felt the wet sting of tears on my cheeks. Yes, there were tears, but no sound. I thought of the ape in the hold of the ship silently opening and closing his mouth. Some outside force seemed to be guiding me now as though I was a mechanically controlled robot. I began walking down the hallway to the cellar door. The darkness didn't frighten me. It was my friend. I went down the cellar steps in perfect calm, never thinking to snap on the light. No, it was the darkness that soothed me, whispered to me. The darkness and the presence of my friend. He sensed me, of course. And more than that, he expected me. He knew I was coming. I went to him. There he was, outlined in the dim light of a faraway street lamp, coming into the cellar from the grating over my head. <laughs> yes, my friend. You want to be free, don't you? <laughs> yes, and why not be free? But before I let you out of your cage, we must understand each other. There is a price you must pay for your freedom. <laughs> Am I really being so unreasonable? Listen. You shall do what I command you to do. With an ecstasy of satisfaction, do you hear? For this time it is no animal you will see die. But a human being. And more than that, my friend, you will not only see her die, but you yourself shall kill her. Shall avenge all the terrible deaths I have dealt your fellow brothers of the animal kingdom. Ah, I see you are pleased. And you should be. Didn't I kill your mate? But I tell you, Cecily drove me to it in my need to quench my murder lust against her. And now, my friend, you shall act as my conscience. You shall kill Cecily in revenge. Your spirit shall be my spirit and Cecily will die. Yes, yes, you do understand. Here in my hand is the key to your cage. The key to your freedom. And my... We have made our bargain, haven't we? Yes, yes. We understand each other as though we were two brothers. Yes. Come on. Now. Upstairs. To her room. It is there that you shall sing at last. Yes. Your song of freedom. Your ape song. And so man and ape start for the room of their victim. Start up the stairs side by side in the darkness as the clock strikes twelve for... Midnight and the eighth song. Crane Folliot and his ape continue up the steps to Cecily's room. We went up the cellar stairs together. And it didn't seem strange when the ape took my hand as though wishing me to guide him. And then for a moment I was afraid of trouble. The ape became fascinated with the heavy carpeting in the hallway, patting it with his hand as an infant plays with sand. But finally, I got him to stand up and come with me. We made hardly any sound as we climbed the main staircase leading to her room. Uh, who, who is it? What is it, my dear? What's the matter? Oh, something in the room. I, I hear it. I see it's eyes. But that's fantastic, my dear. There. There it is. Crane, 
Crane, what are you doing to me? I see nothing. I hear nothing. Crane, let go of my arm. In a moment, but won't you kiss me, please? You're, you're going to kill me. Oh, no, no, not I. Come, aren't you going to kiss me just once, as you used to in the old, old days? All right. Yes, anything. But let me go. Good. Now, let me hold you in my arms. Oh, Cecily, I need you so. Why have I lost you? Why did you forsake me, Cecily? No. Cecily, come back. Don't run. You can't get away. Very well. If that's the way you want it. It was quite a chase. I followed them as they ran through the house from room to room, floor to floor. She seemed to be making for the roof, but I knew if she got away from me, she'd never, never shake off the ape. Finally, on the top floor, we caught up with her in the attic. Crane! Please! Please, that ape! Get him out of here, Crane! I'll do anything! You treated me like an animal, Cecily. And now an animal shall treat you as you deserve. Choke the life out of you. There she is! Over there in the corner. No, no, Crane. She made me kill your mates. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Goodbye, Cecily. <laughs> I felt wonderful. I stood over her body and thought I could smell the sea and hear the pounding of the clean waves. And I felt sleepy again. Really sleepy again. I knew I could sleep now. I don't know how long I stood there or how long the doorbell was ringing until I remembered that it wasn't I that had killed her, but the ape. I was safe. Why not go downstairs and open the door? Couldn't get a taxi and I wanted to see the eat first thing in the morning anyway, so I thought I'd come back to that comfortable sofa of yours. Dr. Murchison, the ape has escaped. Escaped? Yes, he jumped out of a window into a tree after killing my wife. Fully it? What are you saying? Yes, right after you left. The first I knew of it was when she screamed. I ran upstairs to her room, but... Queer. What was that? I merely said it was queer. I can't tell you how sorry I am for it. For you. Sorry? For me? Shouldn't I be? In a way. Yes, it's lucky you did come back. We'll have to organize a search for the ape, of course. Call the police. Yes. I am sorry for you, for it. Terribly sorry. The days that followed were the happiest of my life. At the inquest, the coroner's verdict was death by accidental strangulation. The ape could not be found, and the official opinion was that he drowned in the river, his body carried out to sea. Everything had worked out perfectly, until I began to become aware of something strange and frightening and horrible. All this was happening to me. One day on the street. You dropped a coin, sir. Oh, thanks, that dime. I... I have it. Uh... Did you hurt your finger? Here, let me pick it up for you. Uh, thank you, my thumb. Somehow I can't seem to bring it across. My thumb was no longer opposable. I couldn't bring it across my fingers. I never realized what it could mean until... A few days later, at a ball game. Get your scorecard at the game. Can't tell nothing without a scorecard, mister. Never mind. Come on, mister. Only a dime of scorecard. You don't want to spoil the pleasure of the game just for a dime, do you? Move on, you idiot. Yeah, who are you? A quiz kid or something? I said, get out of here. Take your hands off of me. You hit you. What was happening to me? I could hardly force myself to think about it. But I had to, especially after what happened at my club. I say there, valiant old man, have a seat in the check. Uh, thank you, Sam, but I've got to be going. Uh, yes, of course. I see. You see what? Lumbago, huh? Can't straighten up your back. Uh, going to a doctor, huh? You think it would help, do you? I don't know. But you certainly can't spend the rest of your life bending over like that with your hands hanging halfway to your knees. <laughs> A half hour later, I was in Murchison's office. 
Now, now, you must take it easy for yet. We all have our off days, you know. You've got to help me, Dr. Murchison. You don't know what I'm going through. I wonder. You do look rather... I can't stand wearing shoes anymore. They're taught to me. And I can't straighten my back up. Have you ever had rheumatism? Any severe back injury? Rheumatism? You sit there talking like that when I've caught myself making sounds like an ape? Would you realize what's happening? That's what I'm becoming, an ape. You're a psychiatrist, aren't you? We'll do something. You've got to do something. Quit your whimpering and listen. I can help you. But only if you cooperate. I'll do anything. Admit you arranged for your wife's murder. What? With the ape's help. Everything points to it, Folliot. Bringing the ape to your house, your strange behavior before and after I left. And now the transference. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. It's quite simple. Arranging for the ape to strangle your wife put you legally in the clear. But you can't strangle your guilt. You can only suppress it. And unconsciously in your guilt, you have taken on the actual characteristics of the ape. If you say that again, I'll kill you. Killing me would only prove your guilt twice over. Be sensible, Folliot. Trust me. I've taken extensive note on your case. You've taken note? Yes, because I knew that some sort of reaction would set in. Oh, Folliot, no, no. Keep away from me. No. You... You're going to turn me over to the police. Huh? You're against me, too. Everyone's against me trying to hunt me down. But you won't get me. Please, <laughs> 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 Dropped him, and he fell to the floor gasping. When I tore open the door and ran, I didn't know where I was going, what I was going to do next. I only knew I had to hide. I found an abandoned house, hidden in the cellar, and there, there in the darkness, it all became clear. Ape. The ape who had killed Cecil. I was the ape. That meant he was Crane Folliot, and that meant... Yes. I had to find him somehow. Kill him for killing Cecily. And that way, that way become my old self again. Where could I go? Where would I hide if I were he? Where there is green. Yes, and trees. And rocks. Ape, yes. In the park. I threw off my shoes, walked barefoot, concealed in the night as I hunted my mortal enemy. Piece by piece, I discarded my clothes, my jacket, my shirt, my trousers, walking like the animal I had become. My eyes were sharper than they'd ever been. I could see even in the darkness. And then... As the moon started to go down, I climbed a ridge. There were caves, cages, stone houses, the zoo. And then I heard something. Something that made the hair prickle on the back of my neck. My fingers itched and my body shook as I heard the sound that told me I had found my enemy. The ape. I jumped down toward the sounds. My lips. Puffing in and out with my heavy breathing, my head pounding like a trip hammer, my entire body aflame with the hot blood of murder. I ran to where the sound came from, and there was a locked steel door. The ape was snarling, telling me to come near him. I ran around to the other side, wrenched a fire axe and the wall, and came back to the door. I smashed the door with a sharp edge of the axe. Opened the door and leaped into the cage. He reared at me with his hand lens and I sprang in his throat. Holy moly! Jake, get your gun quick! There's a man in there! Who are you? Die! Die for killing Cecily! And die in me too! Let me be Folia! Folia, do you hear? Watch out! The cage is open! Dead. Yes, dead. And I free. <laughs> there he is, Chick. Let him out. Yes, it's he. 
I pronounce him dead. Who'd have thought a man could make a sound like that? It was dark and we thought the ape had killed him, so Jake just fired. What gets me is his trying to kill an ape with his bare hands and doing it. In his crazed mind, this was the same ape he provoked into killing his wife. I'll never forget that sound as long as I live. Never. The complete transference into ape. Yet he could have been saved. Look at them lying on the ground. Too bad we couldn't have gotten here a minute sooner. Sure left an easy trail, dropping his shoes and clothes after him piece by piece. Ape and men on the ground, side by side. It ain't pretty. His toes turned in. Puffs of hair from the ape's throat still clutched between his fingers. His teeth biting into his lower lip. Poor Folliot. Or should I say poor humans? How close to animals we really are. Two bodies lying side by side in the darkness. With no one to say which was the victim. As the clock strikes twelve for... Murder! to be with us again when death pads through the night with glowing eyes and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of the big game hunter was played by Raymond Edward Johnson. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. I believe. The versatility of certain people often seems unbelievable. Mrs. Edith Hecht is the wife of a Philadelphia lawyer, the mother of three sons, a grandmother, a lecturer, and a sculptress. Before her marriage, she worked in occupational therapy. As her boys grew up, she found time on her hands and started to study art. Her sculpture is well known in Philadelphia, including the Fairmount Park bust of Victor Herbert. She continues to live a busy life and it may not be surprising, therefore, if the beliefs of Edith Heck are full of hope. I do not believe the world is soon to be destroyed by the atom bomb. I believe it will continue for centuries and will become a better world than that of the past. From biblical days to the present, world destruction has been predicted. Man continues to cry out that his day is the day of greatest evil. Yet in the light of history, we see more and more consideration given to animals, children, and to women. Compare records of the past with the present in regard to opportunities for the colored race and other minority groups. Once it was argued that the Negro was born with less capability than the white man. Yet it took a Negro, Ralph Bunch, to make peace where no white man had succeeded. I believe that man is inherently noble. I am not blind to his weaknesses and frequent evil behavior, but given the proper environment in most cases, he is capable of unbelievable courage and self-sacrifice. William Shirer, author and commentator, says, Those who were bombed out or hounded in concentration camps came out with a will to go on, with faith in themselves, their fellow man, and in God. I have a son in his early twenties who hitchhiked to Alaska with just such faith. When warned of the dangers, he said, 
I will find more good people and evil ones, more who will want to help me get where I want to go than to hinder. It turned out just that way. On his second trip to Alaska, he drove a car. March 17, 1950, he fell asleep while driving. The car met with an accident and was completely destroyed. March 18th, Dick was on his way with another car. Hitting a ditch, this car also was destroyed, and for a second time, my son received no injury. I believe we go much further when we do not build up obstacles through fear and lack of faith. I believe God does not wish us to know when the world is to be destroyed or when we as individuals are to be destroyed. Everywhere I see evidence that it is a world created for our good, and that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. Furthermore, I believe that God put food on this earth for man's body and soul, and gave him a brain to discover the treasures of creation and use them for good or evil. A good man believes that everyone is entitled to the beauty and bounty of the universe. A good man not only uses his own powers towards self-development and pleasure, but helps those who are not as well endowed. We do not know why some are born more unfortunate than others, or why some parts of the world are filled with darkness. In all great paintings, there are the darks who set up the lights. Sometimes the artist puts the dark where it should not be. Sometimes man creates more darkness for himself than he realizes. But I believe that in the hours of misfortune, man should still have faith either that this darkness is created to bring out some hidden strength or to help him appreciate something of value in his life. Frequently I use this prayer, O Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Those were the beliefs of Mrs. Edith Hecht of Philadelphia, who, we submit, has applied the rich principles of art not only to her sculptor, but to the business of living as well. She faces the challenge of the atomic age with courage and faith, those spiritual commodities so much in demand today. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. All right, Nick, suppose he is the murderer. You can't prove it. There isn't a shred of evidence. That's what we've got to find, Patsy. Yeah. And if the proof is anywhere at all, it's here in this apartment. Well, there's a closet or something over here. Okay. You look in there while I go over these papers. Uh-huh. Don't try to struggle, Miss Bowen. This is a knife I am holding at your back. Now, the case of the tattooed cobra. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is one of Nick's best friends. But it isn't a social call that brings Matty to the office this morning. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, you remember telling me last year that somebody wanted you to look for the heir to the Bristol estate? Oh, yes, Mary. The administrator of the estate, Mr. Alvin Hammond, called me in, but I didn't take the case. And you know why, Sergeant? No. It meant a trip to Europe, and Nick didn't want to go. Imagine. Well, oh, Patsy, you know I couldn't go at that time. Oh, fooey. And uh, Nick, uh, Bristol's wife was a Polish girl, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she was. When she divorced him 20 years ago, she took their son back to Europe with her. Uh-huh, and that's the last anybody ever heard of them. Oh, no, 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 not huh? quite, Patsy. Mr. Hammond had some French detectives working on the case. They reported that the mother was dead and that the boy, Alex, supposedly died in a concentration camp during the war. So, who gets the money now? Well, if Alec Bristol isn't found by the end of this year, the $3 million goes to a distant relative in this country named George Davison. Uh, you don't happen to have a picture of Alec, do you, Nick? No, I haven't, but the French detectives got a good description of him from a fellow prisoner in the concentration camp. Yeah, yeah, I remember you telling me that. He's tall and slender with blonde hair and blue eyes, and he'd be uh, 28 years old now. Why, Sergeant, what a memory. He's lost a little finger on his left hand, and he's got a tattoo mark on his right hand. A blue and red cobra twined around the thumb, right? Matty, you're terrific. How can you remember all that from a casual conversation almost a year ago? I didn't. We fished him out of the East River this morning, dead. Well, there's 
the body, Nick. It's Bristol, isn't it? Uh, certainly fits the description. <laughs> Just as the uh, sergeant described it, Nick. A red and blue cobra twined around the right thumb. I know, but there's one detail that's been kept a secret. Mm-hmm. They only told me because they expected me to take the case. Yeah, what's that, Nick? If this is really Alec Bristol, the cobra should be holding a shield in his mouth. It's his mother's family crest. That was to be the final identification. Well, uh. Nick, that, that's it, isn't it? Yes, it's there, all right. So he didn't die in a concentration camp after all. No. Must have come to this country to get his inheritance. No, maybe so, but he didn't get it. Why, what makes you think that, Matty? Why, his clothes, Nick. They were cheap and shabby. He wouldn't be dressed that way if he had three million bucks. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, in that case, I think I'd like to have a talk with Mr. George Davison. Davison? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, the guy who gets the money now that Bristol's dead, huh? Yeah, of course, Davison may be perfectly innocent, but it should be interesting to talk to a man with three million motives for murder. Davison will be here in a moment, Carter. He's upstairs in his room. So he's already moved into the Bristol home, has he, Mr. Hammond? Why, yes, yes. As administrator for the estate, I saw no reason to let the house stand empty, especially since I expected to turn the property over to him at the end of this month. That is, I did until I got a letter from Alec. Oh, you really heard from Alec Bristol? Yes, last week, Miss Brown. We've been running advertisements in European newspapers, 15 different countries, hoping that Alec was still alive. And he saw one of the ads? Yes, he was living in Marseilles. He, he wrote that he was taking the next boat for the States. What a break. The minute he gets here, someone stabs him in the back and throws his body in the East River. I can't understand why he didn't get in touch with me as soon as the boat docked. I'll bet George Davison is glad that he didn't. Yes. Oh, I like George well enough, but, well, Martin Bristol and I were lifelong friends. And I did hope I could turn the estate over to his boy. Oh, I say, Hammond, you uh, didn't tell me we had guests. Oh, come in, George, come in. Uh, Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter, this is George Davison. Hello. How do you do? How do you do? Well, uh, what's everyone looking so serious about? Don't tell me the long-lost son and heir has finally arrived. Yes, George. Alex has arrived, but he's dead. Dead? Oh, I say, not really. Alec Bristol was murdered last night, Mr. Davison. Murder? Well, and the estate comes to me, after all, eh? Uh, yes, I suppose it does, George. Well, who popped him off? Do you know? That's what I'm trying to find out. Mr. Davison... The medical examiner says the murder took place sometime between 10 p.m. and 2 this morning. Where were you at that time? Where was I? Yes. Why, I I went up to my room about 9 o'clock to read. You remember, Hammond? Did you go out again? No, of course not. But, but George... Yes, Mr. Hammond? Uh, uh, nothing. You started to say something. Uh, only that I remember now that George did go upstairs early. I see. Mr. Hammond, if Alec Bristol had sent you a letter or a cablegram to tell you the exact time of his arrival, could anyone else have got hold of it before you did? Why, yes, I suppose so. Dobson leaves the mail on a table in the entrance hall. Now, see here, Carter. Are you insinuating that I murdered Alec Bristol? Not at all, Mr. Davison. I'm merely collecting facts. I beg pardon, Mr. Hammond. Oh, yes, Dobson. There's a gentleman to see you, sir. Well, who is it? A tall young man, sir, with blonde hair. I didn't ask what he looked like, Dobson. Didn't he give you his name? Oh, yes, sir. He said his name is Alec Bristol. I... Do not understand. Why have you sent for the officer? Because we're investigating the murder of Alec Bristol. But that cannot be, Mr. Carter. I am Alec Bristol. With that accent? Don't make me laugh. I have been in Europe since I am seven years old. Almost I have forgotten how to speak the English. Maybe, but if you're Alec Bristol, who's that guy down at the moor? I do not know. But surely Mr. Hammond will vouch for me. Two weeks ago, I write to tell him I am coming. That's right, Sergeant. Uh, at least somebody wrote to me. Yeah, it might have been that fellow we found in the river. No, 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 it was I. The description in the newspaper of Marseille, that too was I. Yeah? But that description fits the other man, too. But the little finger which I lose in the accident of many years ago, the tattoo on my thumb. Those features apply to him, too, including the family crest and the cobra's mouth. I... I cannot believe it. It is fantastic. I can figure it out easy enough. 
You read that description in the paper, realized that it fitted you perfectly. So you had that finger and thumb fixed up to complete the identification. Then you hopped a boat for America expecting to collect three million bucks. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Matty. You're forgetting one thing. Why? The family crest and the tattooed cobra's mouth. He couldn't have got that out of the newspaper notices. It wasn't there. Okay, okay. So maybe he knew Alec Bristol a long time ago in Europe. He was familiar with the tattoo mark. Why must you assume that I am the imposter? Why could it not be the other man? Because you'd have a mighty good reason for bumping off the real heir. But who'd want to kill the fake one? I do not know. All I know is when my ship docks this morning at 10 o'clock, I get off the boat Now, and... wait a minute. Wait a minute. You going to tell me they didn't send you to Ellis Island before they let you go? Why should they do that, Sergeant? I am an American citizen. My papers are all in order. The consul at Marseille checked them before he let me get on the boat. Matty, let's take him down to the pier. See if the captain of the ship can identify him. Yeah, and we'll stop off at the morgue, too. Maybe you'll recognize the other Alec Bristol. Then may I return here? You may, if the captain of the boat knows you. Otherwise, you're going to the city jail. <laughs> Well, uh, how about it, Captain? You know him? Why, right, yes, Sergeant. This man came over on my boat, and we didn't dock until 10 o'clock this morning, so he couldn't possibly have been in New York last night. Well, there's the body, Mr. Bristol. Did you ever see that guy before? No, Sergeant. I am positive I never see that man before in my life. Good afternoon, Mr. Bristol. Good afternoon. You are Dobson? Yes, Mr. Bristol. Come in, please. Oh, thank you. Mr. Hammond phoned that everything was settled, that I should take my orders from you, sir. Oh, that was kind of him. Yes, there's a letter for you, sir. It came just a few moments ago. A letter for me? Yes, sir. A registered letter. I signed for it. Here it is, sir. But how strange. I do not know anyone in this country. Just a minute, Bristol, if that is your name. Ah, Mr. Davison. Until your identity is proved, I don't think you'd better open any mail addressed to Alec Bristol. But Mr. Hammond is administrator of my father's estate, and as long as he is convinced, I... Well? Dobson. Yes, sir. Get Mr. Hammond on the phone, please, and ask him to come out here at once. Yes, sir. Is, is anything wrong, sir? If this letter is true, a great deal is wrong. Maybe I know now why that man was killed. Good afternoon, Mr. Hammond. Is Mr. Bristol in, Dobson? Oh, yes, sir. He's waiting for you in the library, sir. Thank Mind you. if we go in with you, Mr. Hammond? Oh, not at all, Carter. In fact, I'm glad you're here. Has something happened, Mr. Hammond? Oh, apparently, yes. Dobson says Alec found out something definite about the murder. Oh, yes, sir. He was very upset about it. Uh, come on in, Carter. Uh, is that why you're here? No. I came to ask the names of the people Bristol was living with in Marseille. Hmm? After all, the identity angle hasn't been established for sure yet. I don't think there's any question that he's the real Alec Bristol. Uh, oh, here's the library. Alec? Alec? Dobson, d didn't you say Mr. Bristol was in here? Oh, he was, sir. Those French doors are open onto the terrace. Perhaps he's out there. I don't think so, Betsy. Hmm? Look over there. Behind the divan. Why, is he, he, it's a man's feet, sir. Carter, is it Alec? It's Alec, all right. And he's dead. Dead? Stabbed in the back. Oh. Just as the other one was. Better call the police, Dobson. Oh, yes, sir. I beg your pardon. No one answered the front door, so since it was open, I thought... Who are you? Where did you come from? What's the idea of walking into other people's houses did without... Did you say other people's houses? I did. Unless I'm mistaken, this is my house. Your house? Yes. I am Alec Bristol. <laughs> One apparent heir to the Bristol Millions is in the city morgue. Another lies dead on the library floor. And now a third tall, slender, blonde young man has appeared to claim the fortune. 
We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Tattooed Cobra. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Alec Bristol, heir to $3 million, can be positively identified only by a cobra tattooed on his right thumb. But one man with the secret tattoo has been found dead in the East River. Another has been stabbed to death in the library of the Bristol Mansion. And now a third stands in the doorway, introducing himself. I beg your pardon. I'm Alec Bristol. You, you're? But perhaps I should have advised you of my arrival, but the plane arrived from Portugal only a short while ago. Nick, look at him. He's tall and blonde. All slender blondes named Alec Bristol seem to be a dime a dozen today. What's that? May I see your left hand? Thank you. Oh, the missing little finger. Of course. Uh-huh. Now the right hand. You mean the right thumb, don't you? With the tattooed cobra? There. It's there, Nick. Naturally. And the shield is in the cobra's mouth. My mother's family crest. Carter, I don't understand. Nobody knew about that crest except you and me and... And who else, Mr. Hammond? Uh, well, George Davison. But, but three men have shown up with that tattoo. How, how did they find out? Who told them? The police will be here in a few moments, sir. Thank you, Dobson. Is Mr. Davison here? Why, no, sir. He left half an hour ago. He said he was going into the city for dinner in the theater. Did you see Mr. Bristol? I mean the dead Mr. Bristol, after Davison left. No, sir. After I phoned Mr. Hammond, I went back to the pantry and stayed there until you arrived. What do you mean, the dead Mr. Bristol? Look, don't you think someone should tell me what's going on? Sure, I'll tell you. Over here. I want you to look at something behind the divan. There. <gasps> Alec. Alec? You mean that's the real Alec Bristol there on the floor? Uh, yes, but... I thought he was dead. He is. I mean, five years ago in the concentration camp. They took him away and... So that's how you found out about the tattoo. You knew Alec Bristol in the concentration camp. Yes. He was my best friend. A friend? And you tried to steal his inheritance? I tell you, they said he was dead. What difference could it make to Alec? When I saw the notice in the Lisbon papers with the description... You realize that it fits you as well as it did him, huh? Yes, except for the missing finger and the tattoo... So I found a doctor who agreed to perform the operation and keep his mouth shut. I got forged passports. Are you a swindler? How do I know you didn't murder Alec? If he had killed Alec Bristol, seeing the body wouldn't have shocked him into admitting that he was an imposter. But you're not going to let him go free. The police will take care of him. The man I want to talk to is George Davison. Well, uh, speaking of Davison, Carter, I, th there's something I didn't tell you this morning about him... I'm sure it doesn't mean anything, but... I know. You started to say something and then lied out of it. Well, perhaps you'd better tell the truth now. Well, it's only that... Well, I knocked on George's door during the evening and he didn't answer. Of course, he may have been asleep. Or he may have been out of the house committing a murder. Is that it? Well, I, I don't believe it, but it's possible that... The real Alec Bristol was going to tell Mr. Hammond something about that first murder. That must be why he was killed. Do you know, Mr. Carter... It might help if we could only find that letter. What letter, Dobson? A registered letter that came from Mr. Bristol, sir. That's where he got the information he wanted to tell Mr. Hammond. You know whether he brought that letter into the library? Yes, sir. It was in his hand when he came in here. But it isn't here now? No, sir. I've searched the room thoroughly. Who else knew that he received that letter? Why, no one except Mr. Davison. And me, of course. Uh-uh. Davison again. Yes. Come on, Patsy. Let's get back to town. What's on your mind, Nick? Just one thing, catching a murderer. And I don't think it'll take very long now. <laughs> Maddie, I want to do three things. Yeah, that one. Find Davison, learn the identity of the man you fished out of the river, and find out who sent that registered letter. Yeah, well, Nick, we spotted Davison's car in a parking lot, and I got two men there waiting for him to come back. If he ever does. He'll come back. Uh-oh. Uh <clears throat> Sergeant Matheson, homicide. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Mullally. It's a guy who sent a trace of letter, Nick. Good. A postal clerk went down and dug out the receipt, huh? Yeah. Uh, get a pencil, Nick. I have one. Okay, go ahead, Mullally. Sent by William Jenkins, 440 Winton Avenue, apartment 5D. Got that, Patsy? Got it. 
Okay, Mullally. Good work, yeah. Thanks. William Jenkins. That name mean anything to you, Nick? No. But I think Patsy and I'll go around to 440 Winton Avenue and see Mr. Jenkins. Oh, I'm glad this is the last flight. <laughs> Cheer up, Patsy. The exercise will do you good. Oh, I only hope Jenkins is home. I will know in a minute. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, here it is, 5D. Evidently he's home, too. The door's partly open. If he's home, why doesn't he answer? Yeah, I'll knock again. Nick, if Alec Bristol was killed so somebody could get that letter, and Jenkins wrote it, the fact this door is open might mean... Yeah. Yes, Betsy, it might mean the killer got here first. Let's go in. Right. Nobody here. Yeah, but look at this room. It's been turned upside down. Been thoroughly searched, all right. But for what? Look at all those papers on the floor. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, here's a social security card made out to William Jenkins. And here's a letter postmarked Chicago, which may... Now, wait a minute. Huh? What is it? Wait. Here's an Illinois chauffeur's license. And look at the picture on it. What? Why, that's the first Alec Bristol, the man they found on the river. Right. So William Jenkins was going to pass himself off as Alec Bristol. Obviously. And that brings up a very interesting point. What? Don't you see, Patsy? This whole thing was planned months in advance, so the amputation and the tattoo would have time to heal. Well, of course. Then last week, the real Alec Bristol wrote to Hammond, and the deal was off. That must have been a blow to Jenkins. Yeah. But how did Jenkins know about the letter? Why, I... And another thing. The tattoo on Jenkins' thumb included the final detail, the shield and the cobra's mouth. How could Jenkins have known about that? Well, the other imposter knew about it because he was a friend of Bristol. But Jenkins wasn't. Yeah. Bristol looked at Jenkins' body and swore he'd never seen him before. And no one else knew of that shield except Davison, Hammond, and me. You think Davison and Jenkins were working together? Not Davison, Patsy. Hammond and Jenkins. Hammond and Jenkins? But yes. why, Nick? What would Hammond get out of it? If Alec Bristol weren't found by the end of this month, Hammond would have to turn the estate over to Davison. Naturally. But if a fake Alec Bristol turned up... Hammond could turn the estate over to him, then he and Hammond could divide three million dollars between them. Why, of course. All Hammond had to do was to find someone who answered the general description, then arrange for the missing finger and the tattoo. Oh, but, Nick, you haven't any proof, none at all. Well, that's what we've got to find, something to show that there was a connection between Hammond and Jenkins. Well, there might be something here in Jenkins' apartment if Hammond has already found it and destroyed it. Well, from the looks of this room, I should say the chances are good that he has. There's a closet or something over here. Maybe he overlooked that. Okay, you take a look in there while I go through these papers more carefully. Uh huh. <laughs> Don't reach for your gun, Carter, unless you want the young lady to die. Jacob, let me go. Stay oh, still, Miss Bowen. I'm holding a knife at your back. Don't struggle, Patsy. <sighs> Hammond, could you hurt her? I won't, as long as you both do as I say. Okay. First, toss your revolver over here. There you are. Good. You're a sensible man. So. You were hiding in that closet all the time, huh? I had to. I came here to destroy the receipt for that registered letter Jenkins sent to Alec, and before I could leave, you two arrived. What was in that letter, Hammond? The whole story, just as you figured it out. And when I told Jenkins that the real Alec Bristol had turned up and our deal was off, he threatened to get even with me by telling Alec about it, so I had to get rid of him. But you didn't know that Jenkins had already written Alec until Alec faced you with a letter. And then you had to kill him, too. That it? Quite right, Mr. Carter. Nobody saw me enter the house or leave it afterwards. And when I came back, you were just arriving. That gave me the perfect alibi. Well, well what's next? Don't think you can kill us, too. Not both of us. Of course not. I have enough cash hidden away to get me out of the country. And you're not going to say a word to the authorities until I'm safely gone. You seem awfully sure of that. I am, because I'm taking the young lady here with me. Oh, Nick, don't let him. Wait, Hammond, you can't take her. If I leave her, Carter, I'll leave her dead, I promise you that. Oh, no. Now get into the bedroom, Carter. I'm going to lock you in there before I leave. Nick, you can't just... You can't help himself, Miss Bowen. And Carter, if I hear you trying to break out or call for help before we're out of the building, I'll shove this knife right through Miss Bowen's back. Locked in the bedroom of William Jenkins' flat, Nick hears Hammond leave with Patsy. And he knows that Hammond won't hesitate to kill her if any attempt is made at a rescue. 
We'll find out what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Tattooed Cobra. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Patsy walked slowly down the stairs and out the front door of the gloomy old tenement, conscious of the knife pressed against her back and of the man who's ready to use it if she attempts to break away. Now down the steps and across the sidewalk. You're... You're not going to kill me, are you? I'm afraid I have to. Oh, no, please. Hammond! Huh? Drop my... oh, oh. Oh, that it. knife, Hammond! You drop it! You're breaking my arm! Drop it! That's better. All right, Patsy, pick it up. Get my gun out of his pocket. Sure, Nick, but where did you... I mean, how... When he locked me in the bedroom, he overlooked the fact that the bedroom window opened on a fire escape running down the front of the building. So I climbed down the fire escape and waited on the first floor platform until you walked across beneath me. Then I jumped him. He was going to kill me. Well, his killing days are over. Find the nearest police call box, Patsy. We'll hold him here until the police arrive. So George Davison will get the estate after all. Yeah. He's the only relative left now. Uh Uh-huh. Nick, there's one thing I still want to know. What? If Hammond planned to bring in a phony heir, why did he try to hire you to find the real one? Self-protection, Patsy. What? You see, if Alec Bristol really were alive, Hammond wanted to know it before he went ahead with the scheme. Yeah, I can see that it would have been disastrous for the real heir to show up after Hammond had produced a false one. Yes, Hammond might have got away with the first murder because Davison seemed to be the only person with a motive for it. But one killing led to another. Uh Uh-huh, and that led to me. I (laughs) suppose he figured the state could only make him pay for one murder, no matter how many he committed. Yes, but when Hammond goes to the chair... He'll find that once is plenty. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This, I believe... Dr. Edmund R. Schlesinger practiced law in Vienna, edited a newspaper in Paris, and escaping to America one jump ahead of the Nazis, has served here as a social worker, a researcher, and statistician. He is now a professor of languages and humanities at the University of Louisville. This is what Dr. Schlesinger believes. Thirty years ago, I was thirty then. I thought I knew quite well what I believed. I lived in Vienna at this time. The city was recovering from the First World War. Material and spiritual reconstruction went hand in hand. I assisted and I enjoyed it. I was brought up by my father in a belief in the inevitable progress of mankind. Yes, in 1922, the future of humanity seemed bright to me. When clouds appeared, I told myself, Fulfillment takes a long time. I shall not enter the promised land. People cherishing the same ideas as I will reach it. Alas, many hopes have been shattered since. The birds of visionary dreams did not die. Precious goods were destroyed. But the hard times had a healthy result. I began to sift the chaff from the grain. I am still at it, still an apprentice. My cocksureness decreased. 
The period of orientation had its pains and its relations. Where do I stand today? I believe in kindness as a common denominator of all human beings. There may occur only minute traces of this kindness, hidden deep under rocks of bitterness, disappointment, discouragement. But this kindness exists in everyone. I have lived in many countries. I have lived on two continents. I am addicted to people. I indulge myself in seeing them, in speaking to them, in knowing them. Since I can remember, I have been eager to mix with people. My various professions have enabled me to contact them under the most different aspects. Reviewing my experiences, I believe man is the same everywhere, and there are neither perfect nor hopeless cases. I don't believe we are living in the best of all possible worlds. Nevertheless, I am compelled to believe in this world because I live in it. I am compelled to believe in others because to believe in myself alone is not enough. I may hope to improve when I am able to see improvement in my fellow man. Feeling for one's fellow man is a privilege as well as a responsibility. In Germany, at the very end of the First World War, Leonard Frank wrote a book, Man is Good. I have gradually softened this statement to man can become better. Again and again I have encountered the objection. Don't you see, does history not teach you that this earth is a wasteland and man develops only to devastate it more thoroughly? No. A scientist in Cornell once said to me, the more we know, the less we understand. How does research help mankind? I answered, inasmuch as research clarifies, it diminishes fear. Since the era of the caveman, man's fear has diminished only in a tiny degree, but proportionately man has become better. And I believe that humanity stands just at its threshold and will wander the long, winding, arduous road to our life. There the creed of Dr. Edmund R. Slazinger of Louisville, Kentucky. When the old world collapsed about him, he built himself a distinguished place in the new. Wheaties presents Night Beat. <laughs> On stage tonight from Hollywood, Night Beat, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Night Beat. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began with young love and ended with old death. Night beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. <laughs> Right up there on your kitchen shelf, there ought to be a big orange and blue box that says, Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions. Because cram jammed into that very box is whole wheat energy. 100% whole wheat. Wheaties whole wheat. But it isn't doing you much good all locked inside the box. It's got to be inside of you to help you feel eager and alive and good all over. So first thing tomorrow morning, grab that box, fill that bowl, pour that milk, slice that fruit... And dig down deep and eat and smile and love every bite of Wheaties. This working at night and trying to sleep in the daytime is all wrong. It's getting so lately my only contact with sunshine is my friendly little bottle of vitamins. <laughs> the kind of tan you get from munching on a fistful of vitamins is nothing. Believe me. Tonight, leaving that ever-loving bed was really a chore. I scraped a razor across my face, and I bathed my fevered brow with cold water to scatter the cobwebs. 
And I headed uptown for police headquarters and a couple of one-syllable words with my old friend, Sergeant Kalski. Kalski was on his way in to watch an early evening show-up, and I tagged along. If you've never been in a police show-up room, it's kind of like a little theater. The bad actors are the prisoners filing across the brightly lit stage, and the audience sitting in the dark are hard-bitten, weary detectives who've seen most of the performers too often before, and they know all the dialogue down to the last whimper. The line coming out now were women, and even half-dozen assorted sizes and ages. Okay. Now just stand back against that measurement chart on the wall and face front. The usual cross-section on the police blotter of any large city. Shoplifters, thieves, narcotic suspects, husband beaters, and an occasional common garden variety drunk. Hey, you, on the end. What's your name? You've been here before. That's a lie. Never been here before in my life. What's your name? I refuse to say anything without the advice of the proper party. <laughs> Kind of hurt the old girl's feelings there, Kowski. Not her, Randy. Her feelings were pickled in alcohol years ago. Uh-huh. How about the young one there? Good looking kid, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem to belong somehow. Ah, they all belong, Randy. You can't tell by how they look. Why, that innocent looking doll with her baby blue eyes. Yeah, I know. I know. Don't tell me. Probably killed her grandmother. <laughs> Only two will get you five, whatever she did. It's a first offense. That kid looks half scared to death. Hey, you're on the far end. What's your name? You mean me? That's right. I'm sorry I can't see you. These lights are so bright. You're not supposed to see me. Step out a little. Just answer the question. What's your name? Linda Johnson. But I'm here by mistake. <laughs> Aren't they all here? Uh, quiet, quiet. It's the truth. I want to explain. I don't belong here. You'll have a chance to explain in court, miss. This is just a show-up. Why are you in here? I don't know. I just arrived in Chicago this morning and they arrested me. Well, what did they say you did when they booked you? What was the charge? <laughs> all right, girls, that's all. That's all, matron. Well, as I was saying, Koski, this kid undoubtedly polished off her grandmother with an axe. All right, Randy. So maybe it's the first offense. Maybe even a mistake, like the girl says, but you haven't looked at the book yet to see what the charge says. Well, anyway, can I talk to her? It might be something for me. Sure. Go ahead to the women's division. Tell the matron I okay it. Maybe it's got something to do with the stars, the zodiac sign I was born under. But I've always been a sucker for three things that spell trouble. That last little drink for the road, a right cross to the jaw... And a girl who still looks pretty with a jug full of tears streaming down her face. You'd think a fellow'd know better. Oh, well. I went around to the woman's division for a close-up of the kid with the misty eyes. There was a lady cop at the desk. When I asked her about Linda Johnson, she gave me a funny smile. You're a little late, Randy. She's being released. I just saw her at the show-up. That's right, but she's made bail since. I'll be bringing her out in a minute. What was she in on? Grand theft, I think. Now, let me see. Yeah, that's right. Any details? Wiped a fellow's wallet in a bar. Arresting officer found it in her purse. Ooh, nice kid. <laughs> oh, here she comes now. Uh, would you mind holding my watch while I talk to her? <laughs> <laughs> Better wait till she's released, Randy. Then we won't be responsible. Okay, wait here. Linda Johnson, Meg. Papers clear? Yeah, all taken care of. Personal property release? All signed. You want to open up? Okay. I guess that's it, Miss Johnson. You can go now. You mean you're letting me go? That's right. Until the hearing. Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Department 5, released on bail. Oh, but I don't have enough money for bail. They said it was $500. It's all paid. Bonding company posted bail half an hour ago. But there must be a mistake. Who paid it? I don't even know anybody in Chicago. Well, somebody evidently knows you, honey. And pretty well, too. But who? Don't you really know? Oh, no, it's crazy. First I'm arrested and I don't know why, and now I'm bailed out and you won't tell me who put up the money. I'm sorry, Miss Johnson. We don't have any way of knowing that. You can check with the bonding company in the morning. Probably a friend. Or maybe your folks. Oh, no. No, they don't even know where I am. They mustn't ever know. This kid was scared, but good her eyes had the bewildered expression of a little girl that's been whipped for something she didn't do and can't understand why. 
Up close, she was even more beautiful than she'd looked under those glaring white lights in the show-up. Her cheeks were pale, except for that bright flush of red high up. Her eyes were big and soft, and her lips were full and almost trembling with a strange sort of excitement. Hmm, <laughs> what happened? Suddenly I heard gypsy violins in the background. And she was just a gal, and I was just a guy. Oh! It was as though she'd heard my thoughts. Suddenly she swung around and looked straight at me, only then realizing that I was there. Oh, I... Her face turned a gorgeous red, and then she turned quickly and hurried out of the building. Careful. She'll get more than your watch, Randy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be seeing you. I followed the girl out the front door and down the steps to the street. It was raining. She hesitated a moment, looked around as if she weren't sure which way to go, and then turned towards the corner. I ran and caught up with her. Excuse me. What is it? What do you want? Miss Johnson? But they told me I could go. Yeah, that's right. Then why are you following oh, me? Oh, don't be frightened. I wanted to talk to you. Are you a detective? Are you supposed to follow me? Is that it? No, it's nothing like that. I I just want to talk to you. I don't know you. I don't want to talk to anyone. Oh, look, you're a stranger in Chicago. I just thought I might be able to help you. No, no, you can't. Oh, now, come on. Get under this awning. You're getting yourself all wet. Don't touch me. Leave me alone or I'll call a... You call a cop? Oh. <laughs> come on, you better get under the awning. I was in the show-up back there a while ago at... Uh, Seems like they're not exactly inclined to believe your stories. Then you are a stick. No. Well, who are you? What do you want? It's been like a nightmare since I got off the train this morning. First that man, then the police, and now you. What? What's happening to me? Well, I can't answer for the first two, but the number three boy is a reporter fellow named Randy Stone. A newspaper reporter. No, don't say it that way. It's uh, better than selling dope. I should have known you wouldn't understand. Where are you going? Let me alone. Now come back here, you little fool. Wait a minute. You're going through a red light. She stepped off the curb against the signal. A big green sedan gunned up the street, throttled wide open, and raced through the intersection. Linda, look out. Get back to the curb. You want to get killed? That car. Did it hit you? No, but the man at the wheel. He was the man whose wallet they said. Oh, now, look. Lady, look, I'm a real simple fellow. When things come too fast, I get all mixed up. Now, what do you say we start at the beginning and in that doorway so that we don't get soaked? I'm sorry. My name is... Yeah, I, I got that. It's Linda Johnson, and you just arrived in Chicago this morning. Where from? Molina, Kansas. Did you come here alone? Of course I came alone. All right, don't get sore. I just uh, asked a question. But the way you asked it. You said you didn't know anybody in Chicago. A kid like you shouldn't be running around alone. I am not a kid. Well, I, I meant you're kind of young. Girl your age, floating around a big city on the loose. For your information, point. Mr. Stone, I am old enough to go wherever I please. Yeah, but not old enough to stay out of trouble, it seems. What about this guy in the green car, this wallet guy? I met him last night on the train. Didn't your mother ever tell you about talking to strange men on trains? My mother has nothing to do with it. If she had her way, I'd never have left Molina. That might not have been a bad idea. Oh, if she hears about this, it'll kill her. You won't put anything in the papers, will you? Oh, so that's it. You ran away from home. I didn't run away. I just couldn't stand living in that narrow little town any longer with nothing to do, no place to go, nobody to talk to. Day after day, being around nothing but... Nothing but... Nothing but people who love you? Yeah, that uh, gets a little boring, doesn't it? All right, so you didn't run away. You left home, and then you met this man on the train. He was pleasant to me. We had a drink together in the club car, that was all. Today I met him again in the lobby of my hotel, and he drove me out to this place, the Rainbow Club. But then I didn't like the way he was acting, and I wanted to leave. But he wouldn't let me. What do you mean, he wouldn't let me? He just wouldn't let me. And then a policeman came in, and I started to call the policeman, but before I could, Mr. Blake called him and said I'd stolen his wallet. Wasn't there anybody else around? Just the bartender. Well, what did he say? He said he saw me take it out of Mr. Blake's pocket while we were at the bar. And then the policeman found the wallet in your purse. Yes, but I didn't take it. I didn't. Why would anybody want to frame you on a thing like that? Oh, you don't believe me, do you? You don't believe me either. Well, I, I don't know. The whole thing's a little strange. If you're telling the truth, that oh, why don't kids like you stay home where they belong? Oh, let me alone. Just let me alone. Look. Linda, whether you like it or not, I'm taking you to your hotel. If the driver of that car is the guy you say he is, he's the one that might have gotten you bailed out of the clink. But he had me arrested. Why would he have me bailed out? To get you outside where he could kill you. What? 
Oh, sister, you're really not old enough to be out in the rain. General Mills is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Brandy Stone. We make quite a to-do about Wheaties being America's favorite whole wheat flakes. Well, why shouldn't we? It's true. People eat more Wheaties than they do any other whole wheat flakes, and we're proud of it. For instance, some of my friends say they like Wheaties because they just plain taste good. Kind of nut sweet and toasty, a, a flavor that keeps on tasting good morning after morning, no matter how often you eat them. Then there are the other folks, like some of the guys I hunt with, and they say they need the energy they get from Wheaties, the whole wheat and the vitamins and minerals. They say they seem to feel better all over all morning after a breakfast that starts with a big bowl of Wheaties and fruit and milk. Now, me, I started getting Wheaties because Jeff, my three-and-a-half-year-old boss, likes them so well. And now that I'm eating them, too, I don't know whether it's because they taste good or because they make me feel good. You know, it'll be kind of interesting to see what you think. So, next time you plan to have breakfast, dish up the Wheaties and see if it's the good crisp taste or the good on-your-toes feeling you like best. But really, it doesn't matter which, because you're going to get both. Anytime you eat Wheaties, breakfast of champions. <laughs> And now, back to Night Beat and Randy Stone. Yeah, like King Solomon once said, latch on to a pretty girl and you latch on to trouble. And this kid, Linda Johnson, wasn't just pretty. She was beautiful. A genuine 14-carat trouble doll. <laughs> All in one day, she's arrested, bailed out, and almost killed. So, just like the Chamber of Commerce would want me to, I escorted the fair visitor to our city to the safety of her own hotel room. A middle-class business hotel in the Loop. Now that we were in off the street, she seemed a little more relaxed. She shook the rain out of her hair, she turned on the radio, and we sat down on the couch. That, uh, Frank Blake you met on the train. You ever seen him before? No. He was a complete stranger. If I were a complete stranger, I'd want to kill you. No, maybe I just imagined that was Frank driving the car. But anyway, it was my fault for walking against the signal. Uh-huh. All right, now let's see. You met him in a club car on the train, and you talked with him a while. And then what? Then we went back to our own cars. I said goodnight at his compartment, then went on through to my own car. Didn't he invite you in? Certainly not. He was traveling with someone else. A lady? No, a man. <laughs> you sure about that? Of course. I saw him when Frank opened the door. But please, let's not talk about it anymore. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about you. Can I turn this down a bit? Mm -hmm. Why did you come to Chicago? Oh, usual reason, I guess. Why does any girl come to a big city? So that she can live a little. So that she can be on her own. Mm, maybe you're not old enough to be on your own. That's what you keep saying, isn't it? Well... Come here. What? There. You still think I'm not old enough? Uh, no, you're old enough. But, um... but what? Oh, so you want to play. Now, you're 22, you read a book, you got some ideas about what life in the big city's all about? That's right. So you're not a little girl anymore, hmm? No, I'm not. <laughs> all right, big girl, I'll play. But don't forget you started this little game, and don't say later you weren't playing for keeps. I won't. Hmm. Well, you see the way the uh, big fellas play, it's, uh, it's a little different. They put an arm around your waist, uh, like this. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to get away, even if a big girl wanted to. Mm -hmm. And they hold you closer and closer until you don't think you'd be able to breathe anymore. Mm -hmm. And then his face is so close to yours that you can't see his features anymore. I just... Uh, oh, Linda, you're beautiful. Oh. Oh. Don't, don't let me go. <laughs> see what I mean, big girl? <laughs> oh, you just wanted to make a fool of me, didn't you? Oh, did I? The door. There's somebody at the door. Yeah, that's right. There's always somebody at the door. Open it. Oh, but you here, won't it look... Oh, certainly not. I'm a guest. You look perfectly respectable, very properly attired. The only thing you're not wearing is your dignity. Oh, now go on. Open the door. Hello. Frank. That's right, inside. 
Well, well, what do you know? The man in the green sedan. Correct. Also, the man named Frank Blake. The same. Also, also the man with a gun. Ooh, so don't move. Oh, huh? please, Frank. Keep your voice down, Linda. All right, Mister. What's it all about? Did you know? No, I'm afraid I don't. Wait mm. Oh, oh no! Don't tell me I fell for that one. It's not funny. Oh, let me see. This is the place where you say I'm the lady's husband. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, wise guy. I'm the lady's <laughs> husband. Oh no, Randy, he's lying. Shut up, Linda. And then I'm supposed to ask how much it'll cost for the outraged husband to forget about the whole thing. Oh no. You're pretty smart, Mister. <laughs> oh, the badger game, the oldest game in the world. And I fell for it. Wait till Kowski hears about oh, this. He's lying, Randy. He's lying. <laughs> hey, shut up. Oh. Look out, Miss Drop it. Drop it. Now get your gun. Come back here, you. When he dropped the gun, I kicked it across the room. As he scrambled for it, I scrambled for the door, and I made the street and nothing flat. I was traveling so fast, the night clerk in the lobby could have mistaken me for a flying saucer. And I was sore, not only at them, but myself, for being taken for a sucker. From the cigar store in the corner, I telephoned Sergeant Kowski. In less than ten minutes, police were posted at every entrance to the hotel, and Kowski and I were on our way back up to Linda Johnson's room. All right, go ahead, Kowski. Say it. I got it coming. Well, anybody can make a mistake, Randy. Like I say, you can't always tell by a pretty face. Oh, but that badger game, the oldest racket in the world, and I fall for it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and here I am giving her lectures to go home to her mother. <laughs> Very quiet now. How far down the hall? It's the third door. Stay close to the wall. That's it, the next one. Let's stand back. He may shoot. I'm back. Open up, Blake. It's the police. Come on, Blake, with your hands up. Blake, it's Johnson. Okay, Randy, we're going in. But it's open. Come on. Well, there's no one here. Oh, yes, there is. Look, behind the bed. Blender. With a pillow over her head. Ooh. Drench some chloroform. Get rid of it. Give me a hand with a wrench. Let me get a window open first. There. Now she's breathing. Linda, come on. Come on, Linda. Come on, wake up. Come on, girl. Take a deep breath. Oh, brother, how stupid can a guy get? The kid was on the level. We almost let her get herself bumped off. What do you mean, we? Oh, oh, don't, don't. Linda, it's all right. It's Randy Stone. Oh, where is he? Frank. He tried to kill me. It's all right, Linda. The police are here. You're going to be okay now. Oh, you were right, Randy. He was trying to kill me. Okay. Let's have a straight on this. Why did he do it? But I don't know. I don't know. Was he your husband? Oh, no, of course not. Boyfriend, it was jealous? No, no. Well, did you pull a job together where you're holding out on him? Is that the reason? I told you I didn't even know him. Then what have you got on him? What do you know? Nothing. I... Oh, you must know something. There's a reason. There's got to be a reason. Now tell us, miss, why did he do it? I don't know. I just don't know. Oh, take it easy, Kowski. Can't you see she really doesn't know? Okay, so she doesn't know. But there's a reason. There's always a reason. Unless, unless maybe Frank Blake uh, made a mistake. What mistake? Well, unless maybe Frank Blake had the wrong girl. Unless maybe he was supposed to kill somebody else that he didn't even know and he thought Linda was... Come again? Yeah, that's right. No, that's no good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I better send out a bulletin. Now, what about this guy, Blake? What do he look like? About your size, I'd say. Yeah, that's right, Kowski. About your age, too. 5'11", 180 pounds, 32 years oh, old. Oh, come again. The color of hair? Dark. Eyes? I didn't notice. Uh, Linda? I wouldn't be able to tell. What do you mean you wouldn't be able to? I can't tell colors. I never have been able to. You mean you're colorblind? <laughs> Isn't it stupid? Well, certainly not. It'd <laughs> be much worse if we couldn't tell the color of your eyes. Thank you. Okay, Miss Johnson. I guess we'll have to take it back to headquarters again. To jail? Oh, now, wait a minute. Kosky can't take it back to jail again tonight. She's out on bail. Besides, don't you think enough things have happened to her already? Well, she's not safe here, Randy. It was just lucky we got here this time. It's for your own protection, Miss. Oh, Randy, I'm frightened. You were right. I shouldn't have come to Chicago. Yeah, well, you're here now. Uh, look, Kosky... I know we can't leave her here alone. Uh, how about my place? We can drop her off at my place. You'll be safe there, Linda. We left Linda safely locked in my apartment, and then I went back to headquarters with Sergeant Kalski. For the next two hours, we looked at pictures, full views and profiles of every mobster who had ever been mugged in the state of Illinois. And then I stopped, 
There he was, staring right up at me off a card. Frank Blake. Only here he was called Frankie Bolano. Recognize him? Oh, yes, that's him. Who is he? Let's see the card. Part of the old Red Machete gang. Never heard of them. Wait a minute. Let me look up Machete. Machete. Yeah. Now, do you remember? Yeah, Donald Machete, alias Red Machete, convicted murder first degree, sentenced life July 1941, escaped June 1949, shot by deputies while swimming across Des Plaines River, drowned, body not recovered. Well, he's dead. That doesn't tell him. No. Unless there's... Well, unless the guy on the train, that uh, the guy in Blake's compartment... And he thought Linda had seen him. Well, say he didn't drown. Say he got away. They've been hiding him out for over a year. And now they were uh, moving him. Let me see that card. Height, five feet eight. Weight, 160. Age, 42. Hair red. Eyes blue. Identifying marks. Bright red strawberry mark on left cheek. No wonder they thought Linda had spotted him. Only she couldn't have. She's colorblind. Sure, that's why she walked right through that red light tonight. She can't tell one color from another. From there on, it was a breeze. We knew what we were looking for. Frankie Bellano and Red Bacchetti. And Mikulski knowing all the right answers about all the wrong people, we found them both right where we should have looked in the first place. In a private room over the Rainbow Club where Linda had been arrested that afternoon. After I'd seen them safely into a cell, I got on the phone and called my apartment. You know, could you think of it, it was the first time I'd ever dialed my own number. <laughs> a girl answered. Hello? Kind of a sleepy girl with a beautiful voice. What did you say? I, I said you're beautiful, Linda. Who is this? Randy Stone, that, that nice-looking young fellow in whose apartment you've been living. Oh, I must have fallen asleep. Yeah, well, wake up, Linda. It's all over. Oh, yes. Your late uh, friend, Mr. Blake, is now resting comfortably in the city Hoosgau on a slight charge of attempted murder, aiding a penitentiary escapee, harboring a fugitive, and deliberately framing a pretty little girl from Molina, Kansas. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean a pretty big girl from Molina, Kansas. But why, Randy? Why did he do it? Oh, it's a long story, but mainly because you started to holler copper, and he just did some fast thinking, and he hollered for us. Do the police know that I didn't... Oh, sure. No more charges. They even threw your records away. Great little fix of this stone, fella. You ought to get to know him better. I want to. Are you coming home soon? Oh, no, no. Not not my place. You know, uh, neighbors. But I want to see you, Randy. You've been so wonderful to me. Oh, sure, but... Don't you want to see me? Oh, I do, Linda, sincerely. I, uh... Look, I'll tell you what. You hop in a cab right away. Meet me on the corner of Dearborn and LaSalle. Can you remember that? But why? Oh, never mind why. It's, uh, 4.30 now. How long will it take you? No time at all. But my clothes, I haven't changed. My bag's still at the hotel. I didn't even unpack. Oh, never mind. I'll pick it up for you on the way. You hurry? Oh, yes. I'll hurry, Randy. Swell. I'll, uh... I'll have something for you. Hi. What kept you? What do you mean, what kept me? <laughs> Never mind. Here, keep the change. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Oh, Randy, I hurry. Hi. I'm not frightened anymore. Swell. And I'm so happy. Hold me, Randy, close. Here? Uh, don't mind me, folks. Oh, you go away. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going, Randy? Uh, this is it. Right here. Oh, this is a train station. Uh-huh. And you said you'd have something for me. Oh, yeah. Here. A ticket? One way. To Molina, Kansas. Well, yes, uh, Mom, I did the right thing, all right. I made the noble gesture, and now I feel pretty good inside. I feel like a big man. Hmm. I feel like a big chump, if you want to know the truth. Who am I to suddenly get so noble where a beautiful girl is involved? Oh, well. Maybe if I rationalize long enough, I can kid myself into thinking she had to go home because she was running away from some unfinished business. You try to run away from things, but 
You can't ever run away from yourself. Who knows? Maybe someday I might try running away myself. Hmm. Wonder what it's like in Molina. Copy, boy. You are listening to Night Beat on the Wheaties' Big Parade. Say, Frank Lovejoy, before you get away, I wanted to tell you that was a swell show. Well, thank you, Frank Martin. It's nice to hear. I, uh, I think you do a mighty solid job on the commercials, too, you know. Only I, I think if I were working on that end of the show, I'd, uh... Well, I'd tell the folks... You're absolutely right, Frank Lovejoy. I'll make a note to be sure and say that Wheaties are 100% whole wheat. Just about the crispest, nicest way there is to get all the good nourishment whole wheat has to offer. Uh, any other suggestions? Well, you, you certainly shouldn't forget that Wheaties... Well, I should say not. They're breakfast of champions. Yeah, yeah, and then that part about their... Yep, America's favorite whole wheat flakes. Uh, that's an important point. Uh, anything else, Frank? Well, I think you ought to tell people... That right, they can... right. They can get Wheaties at their grocers any time. Say, Frank, thanks for the help. That was fun. Well, think nothing of it, old boy. Good night. <laughs> Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis and edited by Larry Parkas. Tonight's story was written by Warren Lewis with music by Frank Worth. The part of Linda was played by Barbara Fuller. In tonight's cast were Gerald Moore, Jeanette Nolan, Lou Krugman, and Francis Cheney. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen also on Tuesday, that's tomorrow night, to the Penny Singleton Show on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Nightbeat comes to you from Hollywood. This is NBC. This, I believe. The so-called wonder drugs have done much to ease bodily ills, but nothing has yet been invented to take the place of sensitive, intelligent understanding in combating the sickness of mind and spirit. A physician who has learned this truth through practice is Edmund A. Brasse, M.D., whose recent autobiography, A Doctor's Pilgrimage, traces his struggle from an impoverished boyhood in Nova Scotia to success as a general practitioner in Wakefield, Rhode Island. Now he spells out his creed. Any doctor who is moderately active sees in the course of a year at least a couple of thousand people in his office. In almost 18 years of practice, I have had a good many people sit alongside my desk and tell me of their illnesses, anxieties, and often personal tragedies. From this store of experience, I've learned at least one basic truth, namely, that every man, woman, and child on this earth regardless of his or her station in life, regardless of racial origin, regardless even of whether he or she is moral or unmoral according to accepted standards, is worthy of and should be treated with respect as befits the essential dignity of man. The human body is the most ingeniously contrived mechanism and most beautiful structure on earth. Every bone is a masterpiece of architectural design. Every organ is a marvel of efficiency which no engineer can even begin to equal. The smallest gland is a chemical plant that can outperform the greatest man-made laboratory in the world. If all the volumes of medical literature in the world were gathered together, they would fill to overflowing the greatest of skyscrapers. And yet, we have just scratched the surface of what there is to be known about the human body. And over and above this complex perfection, man has something more. There is a non-mechanical and non-material element in him that is not found in any other form of life that we know. We cannot see it. We can't even begin to understand it. But it is there, and it raises man to a dignity above the brute. 
In a small way, in a small way, a doctor shares the lives of a great many people. He knows their troubles, worries with them, does his best to make them well and happy, and is glad with them when he succeeds. A good doctor is, within the limits of his own field, the servant of the humblest individual who needs his services. I can't say that I have liked every single man and woman I have met, though I have liked most of them, but liking has nothing to do with respect. There are people who become hypocrites, liars, thieves, and murderers, just the same they are human beings. I admit that I can't, cannot help hating such people at times, but it doesn't last. Hatred cannot last unless it is continuously nourished and stimulated. I believe in God and that he made the earth and set it to spinning and circling around the sun. I know, too, that the spinning earth is not intended to turn forever. Little by little, little, it is slowing down. A day will come, perhaps a hundred million years from now, when it will no longer turn and everything will be still. Long before that happens, all the races of man will have disappeared from the face of the earth, and with him all the things he has made, his cities and roads, his machines and books. But even when the last sound made by the last living creature has died away and the cold silence of eternity has settled upon this planet, I believe somehow that the spirit of man will live. That was Dr. Edmund A. Brasse, author, family physician, himself the father of five children, and a truly warm-hearted admirer of humanity. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hey, Ed. Huh? Stop the car a second, will you? What for? I thought I saw something lying back there by the road. So what? It's probably a dead dog. No, no, hold it. It's too big to be a dog. Oh, for Pete's sake. Uh, where is it? It's uh, right over there. Oh, oh, yeah. Come on. Holy cow. Yeah. She dead? Oh. Oh, I think I'm going to be sick. Mm-hmm. Me too. Let's go call the cops. <laughs> Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, if there's a corpse in your cellar and your nerves are a wreck, oh, Rick to the rescue if you write him a check. Oh, Rick. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. Can I make a suggestion? Please do. Feed me regularly. Take me for walks and be sure that you let me out nights. Some suggestion. You do that for a cat. <laughs> Hi, Helen. Hi. How are you? No, I don't know. I think I'm a nervous wreck. What from? You remember when you said I ought to take up something to keep me busy in the office? Yes. You remember you mentioned knitting? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I've dropped more stitches than a cross-eyed surgeon. <laughs> you idiot. I was only fooling. Well, don't laugh. I was making Francis a pair of screaming argyles. Keep with it, strong heart. You'll win out. Yeah, you're darn right I will. Oh, what I said. Darn. Get it? Ellen, are you still there? Yes, Rick. Wasn't funny? No, Rick. Okay, come on over. Let's snack. Yes, Rick. Shame on you. Yes, Rick. I'll see you about eight. Oh. You don't sound very happy. That's such a long way off. Give you time to make plans. Bye. Bye. Hmm. Now, let's see. I've got to take out one, two, three, five rows. Oh. 
Yeah, what is it? Rick? Oh, how are you, Walt? Very unhappy. You should see me. I've got to take out five whole rows just to pick up one lousy stitch. What? Now, oh, forget it. What are you unhappy about? I'll tell you about it when you get down here. But well, the fifth precinct's 20 blocks. Can't you give it to me over the pipe? I wouldn't ask you if it wasn't important, and I'd rather not say anything over the phone. Okay, okay. Stop making like life-facing Porsche. I'll be down as soon as I finish this heel. Heel? Yeah. If you must know, I've taken up knitting. Coming from you, I am unmoved. I don't care if you're building sides. You know, it's a fur-lined money belt. Get down here as fast as you can. All right, Walt. But you'll be sorry when it starts getting cold again, and I won't knit you a sweater to cover your rural blueberry. Oh, now you get over here. Bye, Walt. Getting Walt's goat was a sport with me. Whether he'd admit it or not, he got a kick out of it, too. Sometimes I wouldn't stay on the rib as long as I usually do, but that was only because Walt always starts sounding just a little bit worried. Then I know it's time to lay off and get serious. Now, don't misunderstand me. I never lay off entirely. And I never get completely serious. Those are two habits that don't help find the solution any quicker. They just fit you with a mess of ulcers, and you still end up too worried and too serious. I closed my office and headed for Walt's precinct. When I walked in, I spotted Sergeant Otis leaning back in his chair with his number 12s resting on the desk. Oh, hello, Sergeant Otis. Well, how's the big private detective today? Just fine, Otis. How's the flash of the 5th precinct? Just fine, Diamond. How's the big private detective today? You said that. I did? Yeah. Is the lieutenant busy? Uh, no, but he's happy. Why spoil it? Otis, when are you going to shine your buttons? What buttons? Oh, oh, excuse me. Gravy stains. Oh. Hiya, Walt. Rick, why don't you leave that poor guy alone? After you leave, he comes running in and cries all over my desk. Otis? Ah, he wouldn't shed a tear if he was standing in an onion warehouse watching his grandmother set fire to herself. Yeah, well, give him a rest for a while. I got a big problem I want to talk to you about. All right, Walt, what's on your mind? Well, I don't know quite how to give it to you. It isn't strictly kosher for the police force to go around asking for help. Now, wait a minute. I don't want any apology routine. If you want a favor, you came to the right boy. You know that goes without saying. Yeah, I guess I do. But now, this is a pretty big favor, Rick. The commissioner's on my back, and so is everyone else. It's got anything to do with this city's government. Oh, sounds rough. What did they do? Find out you were hiding a chimpanzee in a cop's uniform, calling him Sergeant the notice? Oh, now, be serious for a second, Rick. All right, if you'll just get to the point. All right, I... Guess you've been reading about these homicides you've been having for the past three weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pretty messy. Well, the powers that be say, solve them or turn in my badge. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Don't they know that this is the toughest kind of a killing? The killer's obviously got a lot of screws loose, and the maniac doesn't need a motive to kill. Don't those swivel chair bigwigs know that a crime without a motive is the toughest job in the world to crash? Sure, sure, they know all that, but the public and the press is yelling its head off, so the pressure's on. Yeah, well, what do you want me for? You've got one of the best departments in the state. When you were on the force, it was the best department in the state. Now you stop that. Then stop twisting my arm. What do you want? I want help. I've got to crack this case by next week or I'm out of my ear. Hmm. You're the best detective we had on the force and you're the best private gumshoe in the city. Well, now, that's real nice. You stop that clowning. Okay, okay. What about these killings? Each time they find some dame looking like the last of a hamburger sale... Excuse me a second, Rick. Yeah? Lieutenant? No, this is Oliver Dragon. What do you want, Mallet Head? Uh, we just got a report from a guy out in the river road. Another one of them butchers killings. What? Yeah, some dame all hacked up and lying beside the road. Okay, get the car out. I'll meet you downstairs. Oh, did you hear that, Rick? Uh-huh. Well, come on. You want me along? Of course. I can brief you about the whole setup on the way over. Oh, I don't know whether it's such a good idea to get mixed up in this or not. Why not? Well, it looks like anybody who gets close to this killer doesn't have much of a future. Well, you can't live forever. Oh, now, aren't you the sweet one? No, that's not what's worrying me. Well, what is that? So when I go out, I want a nice, comfortable place to lie down in. The way this nut goes to work with a knife, I might end up in a meat locker. <laughs> Everybody back. Go on through, Lieutenant. Show them your biceps, Otis. Ah, you can't. How did all these people get out here? This is ten miles from anything. Uh, someone must have heard me call the police. When I left the phone booth, the whole crowd followed me out here. Who are you? Oh, uh, my name is Ed Cody. Me and my friend here found the body. Where is it? Uh, right over here, Walter. Ah, 
How does it look? Uh, the way you thought it would. Oh, you see what I'm up against, Rick. This is the third killing like this in three weeks. Yeah. Oh, I don't feel too good. Let's walk over this way. Yeah. Cody, you and your friend come along. We'll want to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, okay, Lieutenant. Well, whoever the guy is that's pulling these murders, he's a complete lunatic. Are they all like that, Walt? You should have seen the last one. Hey, uh, how'd you guys happen to spot the body? Well, uh, I saw it first and I told Ed here. Uh, yeah, we were just driving along when Max spotted something lying beside the road. I stopped the car and we got out. When I saw what it was, I left Mac here and went back to town to call you. What's your full name, Mac? Uh, McCarthy. Uh, John McCarthy. Okay. What are you doing, Rick? Oh, looking at the road. That's your car up there, Cody? Uh, it's Max. I was just driving. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you went ahead how far before you stopped? Well, uh, about 20 yards. You won't find much, Rick, even if the road is soft. Their car and any other one would have blocked out the killer's tracks. Hey, maybe he didn't use a car. Maybe he walked her out this way and then killed her. No, this place is 10 miles from anything. He drove all right. And this crowd has ruined any footprints for sure. Oh, here come the boys. Come on, Rick. As soon as they start examining things, we can get back to the station. Yeah, I want to go through the whole file in the last two killings. You won't find much. A change of reading never hurt anyone. Well, that's the whole mess. No leads at all, huh? Not a one. I'm getting nearsighted from looking at all the lineup. We've picked up everything from drunks to safecrackers. No leads. Same type of crime in every case. This killer's got a crazy streak as wide as Broadway. Oh, wait till the commissioner hears about this one. Well, yeah. give me a pencil. Now, tic-tac-toe is out. I got a headache. Stop waving your gills and give me a pencil. Here. What are you doing with that map? Drawing circles. Now, you stop that. That's the scale of this city, and I don't want it loused up by your doodling. Mm -hmm. Look at that. So you make a dandy circle. Well, thanks. What's it for? How should I know? You drew it. Drew what? The circle. Wasn't that a little foolish? Of course it was. That's what I'm yelling about. Well, that's bad for you. What is? Yelling. I know it. I thought you said you didn't know. Know what? About the circle I just drew. What circle? The one on the map. That's what I was yelling about. Well, why? You didn't draw it. I know I didn't. You did. What for? How should I know? You're a policeman. What in blazes has that got to do with it? You were a rookie, weren't you? Of course I was. You worked your way up to sergeant and then head of homicide, didn't you? You know very good and well I did. Wasn't it a little tough? You bet it was. I pounded a beat for four long years. I did it by the sweat of my brow. Now, wait a minute. How did we get into this? You asked me about this circle I drew. I did? Yes, Walt, but you didn't know what it was for. Oh, yeah. Well, what is it for? For you. You like it? Ah, it's not bad. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You lowlife, you conniving, dirty, underhanded louse. You always do this to me. I think you sit around nights and pull the wings off of flies. Moths. All right, moths. You sit around and dream up little monstrosities to pull on the police force and use me as a... A, a, a guinea pig. Right, guinea pig. You call me, Lieutenant? No, get out of here, you idiot. Yeah, Lieutenant. Diamond, for once I'm going to find out what's at the end of this merry-go-round. I want to know about that circle. And I'm going to get it out of you if I have to shove that map down your throat. What was that? Huh? What was that you said, Livingston? This is the commissioner. Oh, not, not, not you, Commissioner. Hey, and I can't have any of these killings. Yes, Commissioner. I want you to put on more pressure. Yes, Commissioner. What have you done about the latest kid? Well, I just went out and looked at the body. Well, that is my man. Yes, but... This department has been sitting around like an F. Uh, but, but... I'm giving you five and I have not said I'm plenty of it. Uh, but, but, but... Your motor's running. You shut up. Eh? Well, no, no, Commissioner. Somebody else. All right. But if I don't get to mention in the next 24 hours, you're going to be pretty silly. Yes, sir. Get busy, Anna, and I'm not kidding. Get busy. Yes, sir. Oh. Who was it? I am not talking to you. Don't you want to know about the circle? No. Fine, fine. Well, when I was looking over the reports on the killings, I noticed something. You don't say. Say what? Okay, okay, if you don't want to play. Be a sore head all your life. Well, I noticed that all of the killings, including the one we looked at this afternoon, were within at least ten miles of each other. And the first one, this one right here was exactly in the opposite direction from the last one. Bully for you. No, it's, it's nothing. Nothing. Well, using the first and last homicide for the edge of the circle, we find that the other killing also falls within the sphere. Okay, so what? Mm-hmm. Getting interested? Well, the girl this afternoon had been dead for about, oh, 14 hours, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but the coroner can come closer. Well, about, anyway. In the other two cases, it says that both girls were killed about three in the morning. 
If the last one was dead 14 hours, she comes close to that time, too. Okay, okay. What does that prove? Not a thing, not a thing. But it's something to go on. This is a wild one, Walt. But let's say that our killer started off with his victim, victim somewhere, uh, oh, within that circle. To drive five miles, half the distance of the circle, it would take him, oh, about... Uh, Fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm, Fifteen minutes. Now, that means he left his starting point around 2.45. That's a funny hour to be so consistent. You're right. Bars close at 2, 45 minutes to talk a dame into a ride. Mm, Might be. Well, I'll be done. I may be all wet. The killer probably started from somewhere outside the circle. But we can start by eliminating the idea of the night spots anyway. Yeah, Lieutenant. Send out a 508 and get everybody in here. I want to check on all the night spots from, uh... 45th Street and Broadway at the center of the circle. From 45th Street and Broadway for 10 miles in every direction. Yeah, Lieutenant. Now, that means cafes, bars, bowling alleys, anything that stays open until 2 or after. And step on it. Uh, I hope we're right. So do I. I don't like walking on eggs. Then sit down. Who knows? You might hatch something. NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Walt found out the name of the last victim and the family supplied us with the picture. Her name is Martha Kirk. And they knew nothing of her whereabouts the night of the murder. You can't really appreciate a police department until you really see them in action. Inside of two hours, Walt had every dive, bar, and night spot in the ten-mile circle tagged. They spread out, one man to every five blocks, each with a picture of the three murdered girls. Because it had been my idea, Walt wanted me to swim with it and maybe sink. I took a little section from 48th Street to 46th Street, and by late afternoon, I'd covered most of the likely prospects. Yeah, you guessed it. The bottom of the barrel was coming up fast, and it was emptier than a ballpark during a thunderstorm. No one had ever seen the three victims. The last spot on the list was a bowling alley. I walked in and spotted a cocktail lounge, and when I climbed up on one of the stools, a bartender with a head that should have been out on the alley walked up to me. Yeah, well, it be. Oh, how about a glass of milk? A glass of milk? Think you can stand it? Well, if you're worried, water it a little. I don't want to pass out on you. <laughs> I get him. He made him funny. <laughs> so did your family. You're looking for trouble? Only if I get pushed. I'm looking for information. Uh, place stall on the left. Yeah. Yeah, you ever seen uh, any of these girls before? What are you, a cop? Well, let's just say I'm nosy. And I've got a badge to keep me in the spirit of things. Oh, why don't you say so? Uh... Uh, let me see. All right. Here's the first one. Uh, no, 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 no. I ain't never seen her. How about this one? Uh-uh. And this one? Yeah. Hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sure, I know. This one comes to me about twice a week. It was in last night. Gets lushed up and cries about how tough a family is on him. Uh, let's see, her name is... Uh, Kirk? Baba. Yeah, yeah, Martha. Martha Kirk. Nice looker. She was. Huh? Did she ever come in here with a man? No, but sometimes she leaves with one. Same guy every time? Uh, Do you remember her leaving with a man last night? Hey, yeah. Come to think of it, she did. What time? About 2.15. We stopped serving at 2. Right on the dot, that we do. Oh, that you do, yeah. Okay. Think you'd know the guy if you saw him again? Sure, he comes in a couple times a week, too. I seen him pick up a couple of strays. (laughs) I I guess you call him a wolf. Yeah, with a hatchet. Huh? Forget it. Where's your phone? Uh, right over there. Uh, hey, here. Use a slug. It's on the house officer. Thanks. I hope nothing's happened to Martha. She was a rotten drunk for a one of them. Yeah. Well, she was, huh? Mm. Sergeant Otis, at your service. If you're in trouble, you probably deserve us. Oh, that's awful. Okay, Diamond, you don't have to get nasty. Shut up and get me the lieutenant. One moment, please. Lieutenant Levinson. You can forget about retiring, Walt. You got something? Yeah, it looks like. What did your boys turn up? Nothing yet. What is it, Rick? Don't play games now. Get over to the 47th, uh, 47th and 9th. You know the bowling alley in the middle of the block? I'm in the bar. Want me to bring the boys? No, no, no. This is one we've got to play quietly. I don't want to scare our ghoul off. I'll be right down. Hey, uh, bartender, what about that milk? Oh, 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 yeah, coming up. Uh, hey, uh, is it going to be a pinch? There is, Buster. There certainly is. 
Walt dropped in about a half an hour later, and he talked to the bartender. He finally looked satisfied. He had to, because it was the only lead that had turned up. We told the bartender to tip us if the guy showed again, and we sat down to wait. Maybe my rabbit's foot started thinking it was back with the quartet, because around one o'clock it started kicking. The bartender gave us a nod, just as a big guy wandered in and sat down at the bar. He weighed in at about 2.20, and his clothes were sloppy. He ordered a drink and started eyeing a cute little number sitting at the other end of the bar. Let's take him. Now, hold it, Walt. He's making a pitch. What? The dame at the end of the bar. So he's making a pitch. What do you want him to do? Wait around till he takes her out of here? Maybe you'd like to help him sharpen his axe. Look, you haul him in now, you'll have to beat it out of him. You want him to pick the dame up? Is that against the law? Arrest me. Stop your clowning. You'd rather catch him with the goods, wouldn't you? Yeah, but now don't start that again. You butted the commission to the death. Just relax. Maybe you can pick up a few pointers. Our big boy moved, all right. Right up at the seat next to the cute little girl. She was under full sail and didn't seem to mind at all. He landed at 1.15. At 1.30, he'd established a firm beachhead. And by 2 o'clock, there was a flag raising. Okay, he scored. The joint's closing. I'm believing I'm going to tail him. How? He's probably got a car. He'd spot you sure if he takes her out to some lonely place. Uh, how do I know? You put in a call, throw a dragnet around this area for ten miles. I'm not going to let you. If he gets away with that girl, he may kill her. Look, Walt, I promise you, he won't get into that car unless I can stick with him. Come on, we'll both stick close to him until I can think of something. We followed the man and girl outside and walked a few yards behind, making like we had a little load on they headed for a big parking lot, and that's when I got the idea. The parking attendant was just walking up to him when I stumbled forward. Hey, uh, boy, boy. Rick, what are you doing? Stay with me, Walt. Yeah, mister? Sonny, I'd, I'd like to have an automobile for you. Hey, just a minute. I was here first. Sure, honey. Don't let him get away with it. Yeah. Oh, look, old man. You're, my, my, my friend here is late getting home, and he's got a wife that's ten feet tall. You mind if I got my car first? <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. Then. No, relax, honey, relax. We're going to take a little drive. Huh? Yeah. Okay, mister, let's see your ticket. <laughs> well, I got it here. I'm glad right in my pocket. Come on, we'll walk up. I, I know where the car is. Okay, but you got to have a ticket. Rick, what's going on? Keep walking. Hey, hey, I thought you was loaded. Keep going with the police. You what? That's right. Well, what's wrong? Which one is that guy's car? You mean the guy back there with the dame? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, he gave me his ticket... Oh, it's right over there, the coop. Rick, come on. I'm going to climb in that trunk, and you're going to get in your car and tail us. But stay far enough behind so that he doesn't spot you. Okay, but I think you're crazy. I know. Is the trunk open? Yeah, I'll get going. Well, they'll see me coming back. Well, then tell him you forgot something in the bowling alley. I passed out in my car. All right. And, uh, son. Yeah? Don't let on that anything happened. We think that man is a killer. Oh, I squeezed into the trunk and waited. About two minutes later, the lovebird showed up and got in the front seat. I rode like that for about 15 minutes, and it wasn't bad until we hit the dirt road. Then my inside started bouncing around like a pound of rice in a wind tunnel. We drove for about 10 minutes more and came to a stop. I raised the trunk just enough to get some fresh air and listen. I didn't want to climb out because they'd feel the movement up in front. I was sure they could hear my breathing. Oh. 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 What are we stopping for? <laughs> I, uh, I thought maybe that... Uh, huh? I wanted to look at the pretty scenery. Well, how can you? Uh-huh. So dark. Mm. Uh-huh. I can see you, baby. Dad? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> You're nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm. So are you. It went on like that for another five minutes, and I started thinking I'd picked the wrong guy. Then the conversation changed. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> What's the funny? Don't you know? No, and I don't like the way you're acting. Women. That's what's funny. All the same. Huh? Like my wife. She was like all the other women. Hey, let's get out of here. You're talking funny. Funny, yeah. 
See a man and you like him, any man. You're all alike. Now you stop that. I just came along now because... Now come here. No. You let me go. You ain't no different. Come no. here. No. Stop that. Let me get out of the car. Sure. Go ahead. I don't want no blood stains on the seats anyway. Blood? Go on, run. I'll catch you. I rolled out and didn't forget to take my 38 along. I spotted him in the moonlight, moving after her like a big animal. He was laughing. I could see he had something in his hand. It was a knife. She tripped and fell, and he moved in. He gave me goosebumps bigger than a grapefruit. When he was nearly on top of her, I closed in. Okay, hold it, hold it. Drop the knife. Good evening, Francis. Is uh, Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study, knitting. Knitting? Knitting. Mm, thank you, Francis. Knit one, pearl two. Knit one, pearl two. Knit one, pearl two. Drop three. That's the way I do it. Rick. Hello, baby. Oh, look what I've gotten into. I'm a nervous wreck. I'll never teach you. What are you building? It was going to be a surprise for you. Oh, a whole suit. <laughs> Silly. Rick, I'll get it. Hello? Oh, Helen, is Rick there? Oh, just a minute. It's Walt, Rick. Oh, well, give me that phone. Where are you? Why didn't you follow me like I told you to? Well, something happened. Well, what happened, you big ox? I could have been killed out there. I'm sorry, but... Uh, Why didn't you follow me? I got caught in the Triborough Bridge, and I didn't have a quarter. Why didn't you use your police badge? Holy smoke. Now you tell me. Ricky. Oh, uh, yeah. I need relaxing. You need relaxing? Oh, swell. Ricky. Come here. I know just the thing. No, no, come over here. There's an old spinning wheel in the parlor. Spinning dreams of a long, long ago. Ricky. What's the matter, dear? Oh. Well, how about this one? Wilhelmina. Let's, let me start that again, will you? I didn't get started very well. Wilhelmina. She's the cutest little girl in Copenhagen. Wilhelmina. She has all the fellows crazy in the noggin. In Copenhagen. All the roses on her cheeks And the music when she speaks And how sweet her kisses taste Sugar cane is like my mama's Danish pastry Wilhelmina Maybe soon we'll elope in Copenhagen Wilhelmina We'll share everything including my toboggan In Copenhagen All the other girls say no but Wilhelmina, she says nine. All the boys call Wilhelmina Willie. But I call Wilhelmina mine. Well, no, no, no. How did you like that, huh? Well, it was wonderful, but where did the orchestra come from? Oh, the orchestra? Well, did you like it? Mm-hmm. No, don't knock it. Rick. Mm hmm I told you I needed relaxing. Oh, well, how's this? Rag mop. Rag mop. Rag mop. Oh, no, Rick! Rag mop. I started that one right. I got to like that one, too. You can sing later. Oh, oh, all right, all right. Now, what is it, little baby? Come here. Hmm. You know something? What? I may never sing again. You 
have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley, who soon will be seen in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle, Wilms Herbert, Lorene Tuttle, Bill Conrad, Peter Leeds, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Warren Lewis. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Look for the private life story of Dick Powell, Pie Face and the Private Eye, in the May issue of Movie Stars Parade on your new stands now. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Dimension X, from the annals of science fiction, a new radio series about men and science and a future destiny. Saturday on NBC, here, Dimension X. Dick Powell and June Allison tomorrow on Screen Guild Theater on NBC. This, I believe. A direct descendant on his mother's side of John Alden and Priscilla Mullen, and on his father's of Rhode Island's Roger Sherman, Colonel Edward Allen Sherman is an active and distinguished American in his own right. Like his five brothers, including the late Admiral Forrest Sherman, he was on active service in World War II. At present, he heads Massachusetts Committee for the Hoover Report. This is what he believes. I believe that in back of the position my country occupies in today's world is an ultimate purpose. World leadership is not ours by accident, nor did we seize it by conquest. It is entrusted to us to see if we are worthy of it. Along with the torch of leadership, has been given us an awesome responsibility for the onward and upward progress of all mankind. It was my privilege to be the eldest son of a man who taught his six sons a sense of personal duty toward God, country, and family. In his last hour of this life, my father's thoughts were about his six sons, scattered all over the globe, serving their country. With such a heritage, it naturally follows that I believe it to be sweet, fitting, and proper for an American to not only die for his country, but to live for his country. Being born with freedom of choice, I recognize the importance of the individual soul, accept the responsibility for individual morality, and assume my share of the total burden placed upon the shoulders of those who must resolve the problems of today's world. Rather than to just sit by and moan about the darkness around us, I have lit for my own use these ten candles to light me on my way. These ten candles which I describe as my personal decalogue of civic responsibility. I must re-examine the blueprint from which our government was built and rededicate the strong foundation stones upon which it rests. I must recognize the inherent dignity of the individual, which is the basis of democracy. I must acknowledge God as the source of both our rights and our responsibilities, to whom we are grateful for our rights and to whom we are directly answerable for our responsibilities. I must apply the same moral, ethical, social, and economic standards that are axiomatic in family life to the operation of the larger social units. I must do my part to regenerate respect for properly constituted authority in all social areas, home, church, school, community, state, and nation. I must assume and exercise the responsibility that rests upon every citizen for active participation in the process of government, I must work to make government an efficient servant rather than a master of the people. I must help to seek out and destroy the power of those who divert and exploit the normal functions of government for selfish ends or personal gains. I must unite with others and participate in organized attacks on all those influences that deny the principles for which we stand. I must uphold and defend the integrity of the economic system that has produced the highest standard of living the world has ever seen. 
We who live on this earth today have been given this tremendous challenge, the task of building a new world. And although I am only one tiny grain of sand, I am part of this ultimate purpose. So my daily prayer must be for the strength and the wisdom I need to carry out my obligations, to fulfill the responsibility that is mine, my share of the job. I had a brother who both lived and died for his country. The least that I can do is to live for my country. An active, militant, participating American citizenship, contributing freely from all resources of the heart, soul, and mind, can bring peace to this fear-weirden world. This I believe. There the creed of Colonel Edward Allen Sherman of Melrose, Massachusetts, a New Englander with deep roots in his country's past, but also with an eye to its future. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A modern gambling ring with its well-organized system of payoffs can be a tough nut for a district attorney to crack. But like little Davy Calero, syndicate enforcer for a big-time policy wheel and book operator, someone in the ring eventually makes the mistake of arousing unfavorable public opinion. Early one overcast Sunday morning, a big coupe rolls into the western entrance to a wooded park. A stunning blonde is driving. Bridal path crosses the road just up ahead, Nicky. We'll wait here. Better put on gloves for this job. Davy, killing a judge ain't smart. I don't like it. All right, you already said that. I knew it was this kind of job, I wouldn't have come along. Don't touch that gun. Here, I'll take it. Only going to be one set of prints on this gun when the cops find it. You going to hang it on Louis? Any objection? The cops will remember how a sawed-off Dipsy used to be Louis' trademark. And they'll remember how he blew his top when Judge Power sentenced him. Told the judge he'd look him up when he got out. Hey, there's the judge now. Start her up, baby. Davy, I tell you, this is no... Stop that motor. Davy! Now, quick! Up by that crossing. Near up, baby. Hold it like that. This is the last ride his honor will ever take. Now get out of here fast. If the boys picked up Louis on schedule, we'll get his prints on this gun and I... Hey, look out! The car! Just come stall us watch where you're driving. That's a fresh painted turf. You heard me, Davy. And I'm scared. Chief, too bad to call you out on Sunday. Yeah, and goes along with the job, Harrington. Need all this area roped off? Well, there's skid marks and a tire curb rub over there. Yeah, good enough. Judge Tower, eh? Yeah. Took the body in about five minutes ago. The medical examiner thinks it was a shotgun job. I'll let you know later. Good friend of mine, Judge. Fine man. Didn't make him any better. 
dirty, lousy rats. Gang job, huh? I don't know, Harrington. Never pay it to jump to conclusion. But I do know that no man was more hated and feared by the mobs. He knew that, but he wouldn't have a bodyguard. You'd think he'd have seen the handwriting on the wall, Chief. Yeah, especially with Jiggs Minetti held in protective custody and bound over to the grand jury. Yeah, what you got on it? I go along with the police. They think Louis Cato did the job. And it could be. Who found the judge? Some people named McDonald, man and wife, on their way to church. You talk with them? Yeah, got their address. They both heard two shots at the time. They thought it was a truck backfiring, and they just kept driving along. And they saw the judge lying at the edge of the road, uh, right over there. What time was this? Eight mm, thirty, about a half hour ago. No other witnesses? No, not yet, anyway. McDonald said that just before they got here, they passed a car going in the other direction. Big coupe or sedan, not sure which. Uh, black. You want the lad crew on those skid marks, Chief? Uh huh. Also on that curb. You start a checkup on service stations and garages in this area. From the looks, some of that red paint rubbed off on the tire. Oh, uh, I didn't call Miss Miller. Didn't know whether you'd need her or not. Oh, we'll get along. Let's not interrupt her day of rest. I'll be at the office in about an hour, Harrington. After I get the medical examiner's report, I'm going to question Jiggs Manetti. Got it through talk. He might drop a lead, though. Chief, I still think this job was signed. Well, who signed it? So who'd the police have the APB out for? Louis Cato. Well, Miss Miller. Good morning, Mr. Garrett. Oh, I didn't expect. Uh, I mean, I told Harrington not to call you. He didn't. I heard the radio report. I knew you'd be flooded with calls. I found this note from Harrington. Well, thanks. He's over with the police, searching Louis Cato's room. All kinds of messages have been coming in for you, Mr. Garrett. Here's the list of calls. Well, look who's here. Changed your mind, eh, Chief? No, no, she came in on her own accord. <laughs> well, how about that? Beats all how she brightens this place up. Oh, aren't you sweet, Harrington? I got your note. Find anything over there? Plenty. Exhibit A, an old sawed-off shotgun in Cato's room closet. Half a dozen shells. And that's the murder weapon. Louis's not as smart as I thought. Now, did you find anything else? Yeah, this snapshot. Found it in the coat pocket, same closet. Uh, nifty little doll, huh? Mm, not bad. Taken some time ago, I'd say. What's the style of that dress, Miss Miller? Oh, about ten years ago, ten or twelve. Think she looks like a blonde? Well, ask Louie if and when he's picked up. Let's give McDonald a look at this snapshot, Harrington. Took the words right out of my mouth, Chief. And let's go. Oh, uh, Miss Miller. Yes? Glad you came in. I call that fast work, Chief. It's only four o'clock, and they just brought Louis Cato in here to headquarters. Did you tell him we'd be in Captain Donovan's office? Yep. He'll have him in here in a minute. You ought to know more about this snapshot than your man McDonald did, Harrington. Well, that car was going pretty fast. And... Yeah, sure, I know. Here's your man, Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Rooney. Really. Wait outside, please. Yes, sir. Sit down, Louis. That chair. Smoke? Never mind. So they picked you up across the river. Yeah. At Harriman Square, Chief. Thought you could get away with it, eh? I don't know what you're talking about. The murder of Judge Tower. Look, I didn't have nothing to do with it. Got an alibi? Now, how could I? They rigged it against me. You can't have an alibi when it's rigged against you. Who rigged it? I don't know. If you didn't get the judge, why did you duck out, Louis? I got nothing more to say. Take a look at this snapshot, Louis. <laughs> We're going to call on her next. Hey, where'd you get this? You know her? Now, look, you guys let her alone, you see? She's done nothing about this. You keep away from her. What's her name, Louie? Never mind. We can find out easily enough. If you promise to leave her alone, I'll tell you. No promises. We'll have Captain Donovan's boys find her. 
Okay. Okay, I'll tell you. Her name is Dickie Brendan. But if you think she knows something about that job, you're crazy. Now, look. I've been nice. I told you your name. You let her alone, huh? All right, Rooney. Take him away. Yes, sir. Hey, can I keep this picture? Sorry, Louie. We may need it. I didn't get over across the river and talk to the arresting officer. Find somebody else in the square if you can who saw Louie. Right, Chief. Uh, what about this dame? I'm going to have her traced. Get on the job, Harrington. Fast. District Attorney's Office. Good morning, Captain. No, he's not yet. Oh, you bet I will. Just let me get a pencil. All right. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. I got it. Oh, it's a switch. So thank you, Captain. Good morning, Mr. Garrett. Good morning, Miss Miller. How are you today? He's fine, thanks. Are you in yet? He's got a ballistic. Captain Donovan just phoned about Nikki Brendan. I'd better read my notes to you during shorthand. All right. 31 years old, originally from Albany. One charge of shoplifting there, no cost. Uh, here's one for the book, Mr. Garrett. She races jalopies there. Hmm. What else? He was a girlfriend of Louis Cato until he went to prison. Since then, a friend of little Davy Caleros. That's all I have. Good morning, Harrington. Good morning, Chief. Hey, here's the photo blow-ups from the lab. Louis Cato's fingerprints. Prints taken from gun stock. And set. No prints on the forestock or the barrels. They didn't give me anything on that. Miss Miller, call the lab. Tell them I want to blow up on the exact position of those fingerprints on that gun. Yes, sir. Now, Harrington, let's go talk to a blonde. Anytime, Chief. Chief. Yeah. Costs money to live in one of these apartments. Who is it? District Attorney. Open the door, please. You Nikki Brandon? Yeah. Did you say District Attorney? And Assistant. Mind if we come in? Look, Chief, on the map. Mug shot of Calero. <laughs> Must have been taken in the show up line. Don't get smart. All right, what is it? I'll be brief, Nikki. Why did Louis get Judge Tower? Who? Louis Cato. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Uh, we heard a woman was driving a getaway car. How about it? Well, don't talk to me. There's lots of women in this town. Go talk to some of them. They might know. I don't. Well, well. Hiya, Davy. Didn't know you had company, Davy. They invited themselves in. They can leave any time. How's the syndicate doing, Davy? What syndicate? <laughs> you kidding? We thought Nicky might know the trigger man on the park job. You know, Davy. Judge Tower. Why would she know? Maybe you know. Yeah, I do. What? This extra's just out. Look at that headline. Ex con confesses Tower murder. Cato admits guilt. How do you like that? Anything else you guys want to know? Keep in touch with us, Davy. There might be. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the Bridal Path murder, here's an important message from our sponsor. Now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney.
When Louis Cato was paroled from prison, the word was that he was going straight. But because he threatened Judge Tower after being sentenced some years before, Louis was arrested shortly after the judge was murdered. Although all the evidence pointed to Louis, I believed his story that he'd been rigged or framed. But while I was questioning Nicky Brendan, his one-time mall, in walked her current boyfriend, little Davy Calero, with an extra addition that told of Louis's confession. Now, back at the office... There's a tape of Louis Cato's confession in your office, Mr. Garrett. Captain Donovan sent it over. And we'd better hear it, Hank. Huh? Yep. Now, hold any calls that aren't important. Yes, sir. Put it on, Hank. Right away, Chief. Miss Miller? Yes? How soon will the lab have those new fingerprint blow-ups up here? Well, they should be here soon, Mr. Garrett. Call them again. I want it rushed. Yes, sir. Are you ready, Chief? Yeah. Here she goes. All right, Louis. Uh, my name is Louis Cato. I killed Judge Tower. I say this of my own free will, under no coer- co- coercion. No coercion. I killed him with a shotgun in the park. I was hiding in the bushes. When he rode his horse past where I was, I fired both barrels. Then I put the shotgun into my coat. I walked back to my room. That is all. The patient of Louis Cato at police headquarters on the date of August 9th. it on. So he walked back to his room. That means he must have walked to the park. What do you make of it, Chief? And so much baloney. I'll buy that. Look, Harrington, we're going to bear it down. I want every service station and garage for a mile around the park area checked. Will do, Chief. Uh, but those skid marks and curb rubs, well, they just could have been made by a Sunday driver. We'll find out. And I want Davy Calero tailed. Spot the station where he has his car serviced. Get me a full report on his car. Where he goes, what he does, whom he talks to. The works. <laughs> you are bearing down. Now, don't kid yourself, Harrington. There's plenty more to this than a punk triggerman making good a threat. The syndicate's behind it. If we can trap that gang of rats, we're going to do it. Mm. Yeah? Those new blow-ups are here, Mr. Garrett. Yeah, I'll be right out. If you want me within the next hour, Harrington, I'll be over at the city jail. I'm going to talk to Louie again. be just a minute, Hagan. Seem natural to be back in, Louis? Never mind. Uh, this is a tougher rap than holding up a supermarket. If you think I'm going to talk, you're wrong. I'll do most of the talking. That shotgun the police found in your room closet. Was that the one you used? Yeah. Show me how you picked up the gun when you shot the judge. What do you mean, how did I pick it up? By the barrel? By the stock? I don't know. I just picked it up. With one hand? No, with both hands. But what's this all about? You were holding it upside down when you fired, weren't you? Who's going to fire a gun upside down? And show me how you were holding it. Never mind, never mind. I said show me, Louis. Hey, why don't you leave me alone? According to the one set of fingerprints on that gun, you were holding it upside down. You're crazy. I'll make a guess, Louis. That mobster who wanted your fingerprints on that gun was in such a hurry, he didn't notice he handed it to you upside down, right? No. No. You didn't kill Judge Tarr. Look, I did. I did. I swear I did. What are you trying to do? Keep you out of the hot seat, Louie. Unless you talk out of the right side, the odds are 100 to 1 against you. Talk to Louie again, Chief? Oh, not since the other day. Donovan questioned him this morning, at my request. Couldn't shake his story. Louie says he killed the judge, and then clams up. Well, maybe we'll find something at this garage. We most there? Yeah, around the next corner. Garage and tire recap shot. Got overlooked in the first checkup. 
You spotted her this noon? Yeah, mostly by luck. Drove in for gasoline. Boss was out for lunch. The kid said sure he knew my pal, Davy Calero. Said Davy tipped him five bucks for putting on four new tires last Monday. Yeah, might be it, Hagen. Kid didn't know what the boss had done with the old set. Oh, there's the place, Chief. Anderson's. Drive right up in. I didn't see the lab report. Were there any tire specs on the curb? Yes, white sidewalls. Are you Anderson? That's right. What can I do for you? A couple of minutes of your time. I'm the district attorney. Here's my identification. Uh oh. <laughs> what have I done that's wrong? As far as I know, nothing. Is Davy Calero a customer of yours? Yeah. Yeah, he comes in here. Regular customer? Yeah, we service his car. He looks just off the boulevard over there. What does he drive? The car's over in the wash rack now. Uh, that big coupe. I'll go look it over, Chief. All right. Understand Calero had four new tires put on last Monday. Oh, that's right. Did he buy them here? Um, yeah. Yeah, he bought them here. Say, I hope it's okay to tell you all this. You know, he's a good customer. I don't want to... Wouldn't it be okay if you didn't? Oh, no offense, mister. You got the other tires? I... I guess so. Don't you know? Yeah, we get a lot of them. Hard to keep track of all of them. Maybe we already recapped them. We'll take a look in the shop. Do you wash tires before you recap them? That's right. We do here. We do a good job. Solution? That's right. My own formula. Cleans off dirt, stains, just like that. Paint, too? Yeah, sure. You got a white side wall? You ought to try my formula, mister. Let's see. That'd be, uh, 7615 to... I'll take a look. Well, that could be the car, Chief. You want to help with the lab? No, not yet, Harrington. Maybe later. I got the information on it. Here they are, Mister. All recap. Give you a good deal on it. There'll be no deal, Anderson. I'll see you don't lose anything, though. Have the lab crew take them off, Harrington. Right. It's a long shot, but it's the only one we've got. I'm a good restaurant out along the shore, baby. I get some lunch by the ocean, maybe you'll feel better. Did they bring over the car? Anderson said he'd have it here by two o'clock. It's after two now. Well, I don't see it. Ah, those bums. They never get nothing done on time. Well, I'll go back up and call them. Now, we can walk to the garage, baby. Come on. They're always late. All right, all right. It ain't important. Anyway, it's got you talking again, baby. Last couple of days, I began to think you lost your voice. Davy, how do you figure it? Figure what? You know, Louis Kale signed his name to that job. I told you a half dozen times, Nicky. Maybe he thinks the job was too well rigged against him. And if he takes the rap, the syndicate will get him a mouthpiece, get him out of the chair. I wonder. Okay, you'll figure it. You think Louis knows we was in on it? He's got an idea. He knows I'm the enforcer. Well, I mean, do you think... You think he knows I was in on it? What's the difference what he knows, baby? Now, live enough a little, will you? Come on, live enough. I can't, Davey. It don't feel right. You're going out looking for trouble? Look, Louis signed it. That's all there is. Yeah, but those cops coming to my place. They have to make that job look good. We ain't got a thing to worry about. There's the car the kid's still working on. I hope you're right, Davey. About not worrying. But there's another thing. Those tires. I wish you'd had them burn. When I scrape that I tell you, we're in the clear now. Shut up about it. Hey, Anderson, ain't you got any idea of time? I'm sorry, Mr. Clary. Want to do a good polish job for you, too. Okay, okay. Always excuse. Come on, let's get going, Davey. I want to take those other tires along, Davey. Put them in the chair. Listen, I... I ain't kidding. I mean it. Please. <sighs> okay. Bring them out, Anderson. The tires I turned in for these. They're not here, Mr. Clary. Sell them? Oh, no. Uh, the police car came and picked them up. Oh? Well, get my car and hurry. She's wise to anything, Chief. She may not come to the door. And we'll get in. Open the door, Nikki. We know you're in there. I don't be in such a hurry. What do you want? Hey, quit shoving, will you? You've got no manners at all. 
Mickey, I understand you drove in jalopy races in Albany. Well, what if I did? You won a lot of them, too, they tell me. You're a good driver. Good enough to be on the syndicate payroll. I don't know what you're talking about. You'll find out right away, Blondie. And I can't understand you rubbing that curb, Nicky. That was a big mistake. Because the police lab crew found a couple of tiny specks of red paint left on the tire. The same paint that was on that curb. What are you trying to say? That you drove the getaway car from the murder of Judge Tower. That's a lie. I don't know anything about it. You were seen, Nicky. You were crying. I tell you, it's a lie. You got Louis Cato. We talked. He's a trigger man. I've checked Louis all along the line. He's straight. Only thing wrong is him doing a Galahad for a dame like you. Uh, he must be real dumb. Where's Davy? Uh, I don't know. Chief, she looked at the closet door. I will see. No, he ain't in there. Watch it. No, you don't. Then I'll take me, copper. Put down the gun, Davy. Stand back. Back around. Let your hand up. You can't get away, Davy. The police are out in the corridor. They got the building surrounded, too. I told you to burn those tires, ah, Davy. I should have gone back to Louis. You should have gone back. I'll take it. There we are. Good work, Harrington. Okay, I'll go along. Put on your coat, Nicky. You're going along, too. It's the end of the road for both of you. This is David Bryan again. I hope you've enjoyed this case from the file of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. You may remember the case. Nicky talked. So did Jiggs Minetti. And we not only got all the goods on little Davy Calero, but we put enough of the syndicate big guns behind the bars to break the organization. Davy was convicted of murder in the first degree. Nicky got 20 years. When crime gets too big, it gets careless. Then the law takes over. Always. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Philip H. Lawrence.